Hello, and welcome to Google I.O. 2017, our annual developer festival. I'm Timothy Jordan, a developer advocate at Google, and I'll be touring the I.O. venue throughout the next three days, exploring the sandboxes, interviewing Googlers, and giving you eyes on the ground. That's right, even though you're joining remotely, this year you'll get an in-depth look at everything happening at Shoreline, not just the sessions. You can follow along on any of the live stream channels on google.com slash IO. Google I.O. is an outdoor developer festival hosting 7,200 attendees at Shoreline Amphitheater, along with millions of viewers on the live stream. That's you. And thousands of developers at more than 450 local I.O. extended events across 80 countries. We have 14 content tracks with over 150 breakout sessions, all live streamed on google.com slash I.O. There's also over 70 code labs live to get you up and running with our latest APIs today at g.co slash IO slash code labs. But before you get to any of that, let's review a handful of the announcements you just heard. Smart Reply, available in Inbox by Gmail and Allo, saves you time by suggesting quick responses to your messages. It utilizes machine learning to give you better responses the more you use it, and it already drives 12% of replies in Inbox on mobile. Starting today, Smart Reply is coming to Gmail for Android and iOS too. We're excited to announce that our second generation tensor processing units are coming to Google Compute Engine as cloud TPUs, where you can connect them to virtual machines of all shapes and sizes and mix and match them with other types of hardware, including Skylake CPUs and NVIDIA GPUs. You can program these cloud TPUs with TensorFlow, the most popular open source machine learning framework on GitHub, and we're introducing high-level APIs, which will make it easier to train machine learning models on CPUs, GPUs, or cloud TPUs with only minimal code changes. Many top researchers don't have access to anywhere near as much compute power as they need. To help as many researchers as we can and further accelerate the pace of open machine learning research, we will make 1,000 cloud TPUs available at no cost to ML researchers via the TensorFlow Research Cloud. Android O, coming later this year, will bring more fluid experiences to your smaller screen, as well as improvements to battery life and security. With Picture-in-Picture, -picture, you can seamlessly do two tasks simultaneously, and Smart Text Selection improves copy and paste by using machine learning to recognize entities on the screen. Google Play Protect is Google's comprehensive security services for Android, which provides powerful new protections and greater visibility into your device security. Play Protect is built into every device with Google Play, is always updating, and automatically takes action to keep your data and device safe. We also have an early preview of a new initiative for entry-level Android devices that internally we call Android Go. The goal is to get computing into the hands of more people by creating a great smartphone experience on all Android devices with one gigabyte or less of memory. Android Go is designed with features relevant for people who have limited data connectivity and speak multiple languages. Of course, way more was covered in the Google Keynote, including new ways to share with Google Photos, including photo books, new ways that Google Assistant can help you do even more, investments in the core technologies that enable VR and AR, and in platforms that make them accessible to more people. Have questions about IO17? Tweet them starting today through May 19th using hashtag IO17Request. A team of Googlers will be on site chasing down answers for you. Make sure to also follow the conversation on hashtag IO17 and on the Google Developers blog. Make sure to tune in to the Developer Keynote at 1 p.m. Pacific time, and I'll see you right here on the live stream between all the sessions. This is Google IO 2017. Hi, I'm Sarah from the Google Developer Certification Team. Last year, we launched the Associate Android Developer Certification at I.O. Now we're adding two certifications for mobile web developers. Why mobile? Mobile now accounts for over half of all web traffic. Users expect their small screen experiences to be as quick and intuitive as those on a desktop. But making the mobile web fast and easy takes some special skills. How can you prove you've learned them? We've created two new certifications to help developers get recognized for their knowledge and skill.
introducing the Mobile Site Certification and the Mobile Web Specialist Certification. One focuses on sites and the other on web apps. Let's talk about mobile sites. What happens to your beautiful site if it takes too long to load? 53% of mobile visitors will leave a page if it takes more than three seconds to load. But the average mobile page loads in 22 seconds. Making this even one second faster increases conversion rates up to 27%. Google believes in the mobile web, and so do our customers. That's why we've created the Google Mobile Site Certification to help site owners find the best talent. Passing this exam demonstrates you have the knowledge for building high-performing mobile sites. It also highlights your understanding of best practices and current browser technologies. To pass, you'll need to be proficient across mobile site design, UX best practices, and site speed optimization. This certification is especially useful for developers working in-house for agencies or clients. To prepare, use the online study guide or e-learning course. Both are free. Once certified, you can promote your certificate on your Google Partners public profile and social media. What if you're developing mobile web apps? Developing applications requires even more specialized skills than sites, so we have a certification for that. The Mobile Web Specialist Certification shows you can build quality web apps, including progressive web apps. You take this exam by solving a series of coding problems. We'll test your skills in many in-demand areas, including responsive design, accessibility, and progressive web application development. This certification is especially useful for developers looking to move up in their careers. It will prepare you to tackle a wide range of challenges. We also provide a study guide and a range of courses to help you prepare. With multiple certifications, how do you know which one to take? Are you building mobile sites and need to demonstrate you have the knowledge to do it? Take the mobile site certification exam. Need to show that you have the skills to build a mobile web app? Take the mobile web specialist exam. Visit our certification page under the Google Developers website to learn more about our programs. Get the study guides, get ready, and let's go. OK, Google, what's the temperature like at Mount Everest? The temperature there is minus 14. Ooh, I better pack a jacket. Oh, hi. I'm Wayne Pekarsky, and today I'm going to talk about the Google Assistant and how you can develop your own actions to be a part of this new ecosystem. At Google, we've been providing assistance to users for years across many of our products, but we think there's much more we can do to help people get things done right when they need it in a conversational way. And that's why we're building the Google Assistant. The Google Assistant can help users get things done throughout their day, whether they're at home or on the go. And it powers devices like, for example, the Google Home, a voice-activated speaker. To better serve user requests, the Google Assistant needs to work well with an ecosystem of everyone's favorite services. Actions on Google allows you, as a developer, to integrate your services with the Google Assistant. And that is what we're going to explain how to do in this video. Conversation actions enable you to fulfill a user's request directly via a two-way dialog. Users don't need to pre-enable skills or install new apps to interact with any actions you build. When a user asks for your action by name, we'll connect them with you immediately. Let's first go through a detailed example of a user interacting with a conversation action. Think about something as simple as helping a user choose what to have for dinner based on their mood and the ingredients they have around. Let's call this action personal chef. The user first needs to invoke your action with something like, OK, Google, let me talk to personal chef. The assistant will then introduce your action, and now the user is talking to you directly. From this point onwards, you get to interact with the user and have a conversation. OK, Google, let me talk to personal chef. Sure, here's personal chef. Hi, I'm your personal chef. What are you in the mood for? Well, it's kind of cold outside, so I'd like something to warm me up, like a hot soup. And I want it fast. All right, what protein would you like to use? I have some chicken and also some canned tomatoes. OK, well, I think you should try the chicken tomato soup recipe I found on example.com. Hmm, sounds good to me. So this is a pretty rich interaction. Think about all the sentences I spoke and how the action needs to extract the meaning out of this. How would you implement this? If you're an expert in the area of natural language processing, you can use the Conversation API, which allows you to process the raw strings that contain the spoken text from the user. You can then use the Actions SDK that includes all the tools and libraries you need to build the actions. However, if you don't want to process the user's transcribed speech yourself, 
you can use one of the tools that have integrated with Actions on Google. One of these tools is API.ai, which provides an intuitive graphical user interface to create conversational interfaces, and it does the heavy lifting in terms of managing conversational state and filling out slots in forms. This means you'll no longer need to process the raw strings. API AI can do this for you. To handle a conversation, you use the API.ai developer console to create an intent. This is where you define the information you need from the user. For our example, finding a kitchen recipe, this would be the type of food, the ingredients, the temperature, and the cooking time. You then specify example sentences. API.ai parses these sentences and uses them to train its machine learning algorithm to process other possible sentences from your users. You don't have to write regular expressions or a parser. You can also manually set what the acceptable values are for each piece of information. Once this is done, API.ai uses these definitions to extract meaning out of spoken sentences. The user can provide information naturally, out of order, all at once, or in pieces. The action can ask follow-up questions as needed. Pretty neat, right? Once you've set up everything in the API.ai console, you can then test it all out immediately with example sentences. Then you can test your project with the web simulator, preview it on Google Home, or deploy the full project to Google all from within API.ai. Next, you can connect up an optional webhook to your intent to allow it to interact with a backend server. When all the details you need are filled in, your webhook is called with the appropriate details provided as JSON data. You don't need to worry about parsing strings or dealing with responding back with follow-up questions for the user. You can also develop the webhook using the language and hosting platform of your choice. It's just an HTTP callback. So API.ai makes this really simple. It's easy to get started, and you can have a prototype working in just a few minutes. You should check out our screencast video where we show all the steps to make this happen. So the Google Assistant is the next big opportunity for developers. By developing actions on Google, you'll get cutting edge experience in natural conversation interfaces and be ready to actively participate in the emerging space of AI-first computing. In addition, you'll be able to help shape the platform and grow your audience in all the devices and contexts where the Assistant will be available in the future. And thanks to conversational interface building tools like API.ai, as well as Google's unique understanding of the user's interests and contexts, you'll be able to create frictionless, intelligent experiences for people that engage with the Google Assistant. You can find out more about actions on Google by reading the documentation at developers.google.com actions. We also have an Actions on Google developer community on Google+, so you can ask questions and share your ideas with everyone. We look forward to seeing what you build, and I'll see you next time. Hi, I'm Nandini from Google's Conversation Design Team, here to give you some tips on how to design your own voice and chat UIs using Actions on Google. Before we dive in, let's have a conversation about conversation. Consider this. All human inventions start as ideas. By definition, conversation is the exchange of ideas by spoken words. And by definition, civilization is the most advanced stage of human social development. It's the tangible expression of our common understanding and values, which is expressed through language. And language is molded and refined by conversations. A conversation is a contract between two participants with a mutual investment in the outcome. But all of that is really hard to codify. Building natural human to computer conversations is hard. But that's because human to human conversations are only deceptively easy. People are not going to change how they converse anytime soon. So the key to closing that gap between modern interfaces and thousands of years of evolution is to use what we know to be true about human-to-human -human conversation to teach our computers to talk to humans and not the other way around. So the key to building a good voice interface is not to fall into the trap of simply converting a GUI into a VUI. Obviously, I can't teach you an entire design discipline in a few minutes, but I can give you five pro tips to set you up for success. Let's design a simple number guessing game along the way. Here we go. Number one, leverage your brand and give yourself a persona. I don't mean a caricature or mascot necessarily, but you can do that too to make it even more accessible. A persona is more than that. 
It's the consistent character captured by the voice and interactive experience. It's the face of that experience for the user. First, list the core attributes of your brand and what you stand for. Come up with the corresponding attributes that can be conveyed through design elements and, of course, the voice dialogue itself. For example, if your brand is known for speed, something we at Google are known for, some attributes of the design might be to be intuitive and data-driven, since both of those elements cut out steps for the user. Some voice attributes for the actual dialogue wording might be engaging or apt or approachable, since those also tighten up the dialogue by removing ambiguity or making it easier for the user to have confidence in the interaction. Write a short style guide covering things like pace, tone, energy level, vocal attributes, and the overall impression that you're shooting for. Try to create a simple bio sketch of a character that might embody all of these attributes. Give it a name if you want. Also, there's a practical reason for creating a persona as well. It's a good grounding mechanism for you long term. Designers and developers will come and go, or multiple people could work on it at once. It'll give everyone something to fall back on for consistency. Finally, don't forget to identify yourself as a separate entity from the Google Assistant. That means greet the user. Number two, think outside the box, literally. It's tempting to draw out a conversation path visually and plug in the dialogue and then dive right into the code or start stringing together blocks of context to write a working agent and then back into the experience iteratively. We don't recommend this. You can, but I promise you it'll save time and give you a much richer experience to map out the core conversation paths ahead of time. This doesn't mean just the so-called happy path. It doesn't mean error paths either. Instead, write out your core experiences like you would a screenplay. This can be as scrappy as acting it out and documenting it on paper, or create an interactive prototype you tweak and play with until you're ready to start coding. And then, when you draw out your initial vision, keep it at a high level, where the boxes present entire dialogues or user intents, but leave out the individual wording you'll use in the interaction. Number three, context. Here are just some types of context you can consider and infuse into a conversation to make it more meaningful. Where is the user? What are they doing? What type of device are they interacting on? How is the experience influenced over time? Where is the user's frame of mind in relation to what they're trying to do? Try to cater to their intent, not to a specific feature. Number four, speech recognition technology isn't perfect, but it's getting better all the time. So for the most part, you might want to treat that as a black box that'll continue to improve. You have to, of course, be aware of its limitations, but try to step back and look at the interaction from the user's perspective when something goes wrong. You don't have to try to steer the user back to the original question if they don't get recognized immediately. There are so many reasons they might not have been. People hardly ever say nonsense. Try to take those so-called errors and make them into another meaningful turn in the dialogue. Finally, I leave you with a challenge. This new world of conversation design for machines opens up a great deal of opportunity that hasn't existed before for us to use technology to advance our lives. Sure, as you get started, create some games, but I urge you to think bigger eventually. Help give someone access to information or technology that they couldn't use before because of a physical, mental, or an economic disadvantage. We're excited to help you do that with Actions on Google. Check out the description for some resources, and we can't wait to see what you create. We're bringing together a really talented group of designers and developers to collaborate and innovate and generate exciting ideas for what can be done on the Android platform. Within this context of a sprint, I really think that the distinction between designer and developer is blurred. It's all about problem solving and getting it done. If you're not working with designers as an engineer making a mistake to begin with, I feel like every designer or engineer brings a perspective to a project. And that's what's nice about working with a designer. You think like an engineer and designer comes and brings a perspective. In this group, I'm like happy to work with super talented designers. It helps me understand Android better because I see how they're thinking about it. It kind of kills my prejudgments about the product and I start thinking about it from a fresh perspective.
We focus in on generating a broad range of ideas that are really innovative and far-reaching, and then prototype and pull together concepts and prototypes to demonstrate and create a vision for what those uh, concepts could be. I never was really familiar with the idea of using this type of process for ideation, and it's impressive to see the degree of precision that Kai specifically has introduced in, in the way that she's run this process. It's been really enjoyable to see specifically how one exercise leads into the next and the next and the next, and how that can actually effectively yield good ideas. We're a very small company, so effectively we're doing similar things all the time, but we often rush straight to the solution. It was nice to see some structure around, I guess, the process. So, you know, it starts here and, you know, you don't get to fix it straight away. It's like, define the problem, then go to this step, then go to this step. And that kind of structure, though it seems kind of burdensome, like it actually improved, like, the, the overall thing we came up with. When you're in a company, you kind of, you tend to think about, like, um, how the company kind of does something and how you the things that you've learned in the past and then like here is just kind of like a blank canvas again and you get to like start new and then rediscover the things that kind of work in a workflow or in a much more creative space. I mean like here we like try to build something in like three days which is like insane. This is the first time we actually like been in a sprint with just doing Android 2 and I would like love to bring some more of the Android sprinting back to our company. I think design sprints facilitate interdisciplinarity, interoperability, and all of the kind of amazing things that can happen from a good collaboration. One of the really exciting features of Android is that it's a very open platform. Um, anyone uh, can come and write their own apps and create their own concepts. We want to bring that opportunity of openness to the design community and inspire designers to generate concepts and ideas and design really cool apps that leverage the openness of the platform. I was impressed with the openness of Android. It's definitely a unique thing that you might not find on iOS or other systems. In our app in particular, there's things that we definitely couldn't have done on iOS that are actually really useful. Um, and it is nice because the app can organically come with you into the rest of your life. I think for me, one of the big awesome parts of it was that I was able to begin to learn Android, which is something that I've always wanted to do um, as a prototyper. I just would like to get to know Android better, and this is like a really big jump start. One of the few constraints that they put on us here at the Design Sprint was like to sort of like come up with something that's like unique to the Android ecosystem. And as we were going through all of our, you know, crazy eights and all of the myriad ideas that we had come up with, um, we actually abandoned some of them that were cool because they were kind of like something that could feasibly be built on any platform. And I think that giving us that constraint infused our other ideas with more creative solutions. And I think what we came up with is like so simple and so delightful and only available on Android. Hello world, I am Ashok Kumar. Uh, <laughs> Hello world, I am Ashok Kumar. I used to play a lot of computer games. I was completely fascinated about it. I started to feel like I should prepare such games. I just wanted to learn how these applications react to humans. Somewhere, the dots were not getting connected. So I started reading blogs on all the possible online resources. Luckily, from GDG Bangalore, I got an invitation for Google Mobile India 2015. If I attend this competition, I could get a sponsorship for Nano Degree. I was completely excited. I figured out that's what I required to connect the dots. It's like being really in front of a teacher. Uh, it enabled me to develop a production-ready application. And converting my idea into reality, something that helps education and make the world a better place. Ah, now I'm feeling relaxed.
when we want to learn something it's not very comfortable for girls generally they don't go out and learn with or uh, with other colleagues they don't prefer uh, learning with someone the reason i go to university is because a friend of mine told me about how wonderful the course is and even if you know nothing about android the courses are designed so that you don't have to have a very much detailed experience in java or android so when i started the course i was like very scared that uh, like maybe it will be too technical for me to understand because i don't know very much about uh, android or java in very deep like how to have some logic uh, into a program and how to code in general but the instructors like my favorite way katherine she makes it so interesting and so normal you don't feel like that you are learning something and uh, it's it's a good way to learn online whatever i feel like learning today i could just go and then search for it and there will be a course available for us i was in hr i was working as a recruiter and i was completely unaware as to what i am supposed to do i used to feel that i just don't want to be a recruiter i want to be on that other side talking technology and uh, talking about gadgets and how technology is changing our day to day lives one of our uh, relatives he challenged me that uh, you are a girl and engineering requires a lot of designs and drawings i wanted to prove him wrong and that was the time when i heard about udacity i started taking some online courses in java and android very basic things it is little difficult but it's just that i don't want to feel that you know that sense of regret i just don't want that so udacity has actually been a, a savior in my life the quality of the projects is very good it's like you know after completing those you feel like you have conquered something actually i finished my nano degree yesterday and uh, so today it's just going to be the celebration couldn't be happier to be here to see the launch of the Android skilling program. There's going to be so many new great Android developers here in India. Good morning everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Some of you know I'm from Delhi. Always fun coming back and and meeting all of you. We can skill up developers and scale up mobile developer training to help make India a global leader in mobile app development. Having the universities teamed up with us in the skilling program is going to be a huge opportunity and make a huge difference. Finally, we've launched it. It's been a year since we first introduced this program to million developers. I think that it's a really achievable goal, and I, I think that it would do a lot for improving uh, the environment in the country in terms of hands-on programming. So I think it's great. It's a massive number. The possibilities are immense. India will be the largest developer base globally, and just to get every want to start thinking about android and developing for android we're at the cusp of a revolution let's do something big more games more users more success yes everything more <laughs>
And of course, you can earn money with the same AdMob component that's been monetizing great apps for years. Last, but certainly not least, our all-new analytics component, designed uniquely for Firebase, brings insight into how well these components are working for you and your users. With Firebase Analytics, you can measure and optimize your advertising campaigns, discover who are your most valuable users, and understand exactly how they are using your app. Now, all these components work great on their own and provide a solid infrastructure to build out your app, but they work even better when combined in creative ways. So let Firebase handle the details of your app's backend infrastructure, user engagement, and monetization, while you spend more time building the apps your users will love. To get started right now with Firebase on Android, iOS, or the web, follow these links for more information. Then, to manage and monitor your apps connected to Firebase, there's a web console to view crashes, set up experiments, track analytics, and a whole lot more. And to learn more about Firebase and all of its components, you can read the documentation right here. We can't wait to see what you build. Thank you for joining us here today. India is coming a long way, as I just mentioned. Today, India is the second largest country in the world in terms of number of developers. Soon, it's going to be number one. What we want to invest in is actually training the faculty from your colleges. The potential is so great, and what Google is doing to help catalyze that innovation is its really an exciting time for these campuses. We are really trying to provide the best possible experience to teachers in these faculty hubs, because the first step to training 2 million developers is to train the teachers that are going to teach those 2 million. Industry, as of now, demands a lot of uh, updated curriculum, developing 2 million Android developers. Uh, being working in a technical university, we can contribute hugely on developing those uh, million app developers. So we're excited that all the raw materials are there to create an innovation revolution in India. Uh, I really think the students are going to make some great things, and I can't wait to see what comes out. There's a lot of potential in India, and uh, we need to take it forward. With Google, we can provide rich opportunities to all. That is the essence of Google program, which I have seen. This is a good move. And this program will definitely be useful to, uh, to the students because app development is going to rule the world for the next few years, Billy.
Hello and welcome to Google I.O. 2017, our annual developer festival. I'm Timothy Jordan, a developer advocate at Google, and I'll be touring the I.O. venue throughout the next three days, exploring the sandboxes, interviewing Googlers, and giving you eyes on the ground. That's right, even though you're joining remotely, this year you'll get an in-depth look at everything happening at Shoreline, not just the sessions. You can follow along on any of the live stream channels on google.com slash I.O. Google I.O. is an outdoor developer festival hosting 7,200 attendees at Shoreline Amphitheater, along with millions of viewers on the live stream. That's you. And thousands of developers at more than 450 local I.O. extended events across 80 countries. We have 14 content tracks with over 150 breakout sessions, all live streamed on google.com slash I.O. There's also over 70 code labs live to get you up and running with our latest APIs today at g.co slash io slash code labs. But before you get to any of that, let's review a handful of the announcements you just heard. Smart Reply, available in Inbox by Gmail and Allo, saves you time by suggesting quick responses to your messages. It utilizes machine learning to give you better responses the more you use it, and it already drives 12% of replies in Inbox on mobile. Starting today, Smart Reply is coming to Gmail for Android and iOS too. We're excited to announce that our second generation tensor processing units are coming to Google Compute Engine as cloud TPUs, where you can connect them to virtual machines of all shapes and sizes and mix and match them with other types of hardware, including Skylake CPUs and NVIDIA GPUs. You can program these cloud TPUs with TensorFlow, the most popular open source machine learning framework on GitHub, and we're introducing high-level APIs, which will make it easier to train machine learning models on CPUs, GPUs, or cloud TPUs with only minimal code changes. Many top researchers don't have access to anywhere near as much compute power as they need. To help as many researchers as we can and further accelerate the pace of open machine learning research, we will make 1,000 cloud TPUs available at no cost to ML researchers via the TensorFlow Research Cloud. Android O, coming later this year, will bring more fluid experiences to your smaller screen, as well as improvements to battery life and security. With Picture-in-Picture, Picture, you can seamlessly do two tasks simultaneously, and Smart Text Selection improves copy and paste by using machine learning to recognize entities on the screen. Google Play Protect is Google's comprehensive security services for Android, which provides powerful new protections and greater visibility into your device security. Play Protect is built into every device with Google Play, is always updating, and automatically takes action to keep your data and device safe. We also have an early preview of a new initiative for entry-level Android devices that internally we call Android Go. The goal is to get computing into the hands of more people by creating a great smartphone experience on all Android devices with one gigabyte or less of memory. Android Go is designed with features relevant for people who have limited data connectivity and speak multiple languages. Of course, way more was covered in the Google Keynote, including new ways to share with Google Photos, including photo books, new ways that Google Assistant can help you do even more, investments in the core technologies that enable VR and AR, and in platforms that make them accessible to more people. Have questions about IO17? Tweet them starting today through May 19th using hashtag IO17Request. A team of Googlers will be on site chasing down answers for you. Make sure to also follow the conversation on hashtag IO17 and on the Google Developers blog. Make sure to tune in to the Developer Keynote at 1 p.m. Pacific time, and I'll see you right here on the live stream between all the sessions. This is Google I.O. 2017.
coding opens doors to make it more than just an app. People everywhere standing up, uniting behind a piece of technology that they think has the potential to change the world. That's amazing. You really have to start to build from scratch what is a story on the phone. With a progressive web app, there's a link, tap it, and install it with no friction, done. I was really interested in doing lyrics generation and TensorFlow was a really great match for that because it allowed me to build out and utilize the models that I needed to be successful. When we started, it was just three of us, and now we're a company of over 100 people making games that we decide we want to make. Success for me is doing what you want with your life. For me, is living in my city with my parents, with my girlfriend, and be happy. And I can do it by being a developer. I won't beat it up to some song. You're diving at the rub or some song. You need to give it up to someone. You need to give it up to someone. You need to fuck so I watch you make. Need to give it up to someone. Before you end up like whoa, 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 like whoa, 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 I'm Jason, and I run our developer product group here at Google. And it is so great to be back at Shoreline again this year. And for those of you joining via our 400 I.O. extended sessions across 85 countries, as well as you joining over the live stream, thank you and welcome. Earlier, Sundar talked about our various billion user platforms. And whether it's Android or the web through Chrome, our success here would not be possible without you. So we're going to spend the next half an hour diving deep into our, uh, exactly what we're doing for all of you, the developers who build on our platforms every day. And no matter what platform you're building on, our goal is to make your job easier and allow you to focus on the problems you're trying to solve by minimizing the pain points of building a product. <laughs> we want to simplify repetitive tasks, whether that means dealing with user login, or instrumenting analytics, or synchronizing real-time data. We want to give you the tools to make it easy for you to solve everyday problems in simple and powerful ways, as well as create entirely new products using technologies like machine learning, and VR, and voice-enabled interactions. 
it is important to us that you are successful. So in addition to being, building products that help you build uh, your, your apps, we are also on the ground in over 130 countries with programs like Women Tech Makers and the Google Developer Groups. Many of whom are here today. So, I believe we have uh, GDGs from 79 countries here today, so that's pretty exciting. So we're also investing in training programs like Google Developer Certifications and courses through Udacity and other partners to help you deepen your technological capabilities. And from this work around the world, we're seeing firsthand that developers are at the forefront of technological and change and innovation. We see you solving challenging problems in ways that could not be done before. For example, Last year, on a trip to Indonesia, I met Gibran Hazefa. Having watched aquaculture become an increasingly important part of his country's economy, he left a career in biology to become one of the nation's 3.5 billion fish farmers. What he found was a 400-year-old trade that was mired in inefficiency, where farmers were frequently over or underfeeding their fish. With his co-founder, Mohammed, they decided they could help, and they started eFishery, which builds a smart, automated fish feeder that can sense when fish are hungry and feed them. As a result, they can save the farmers up to 20% of their annual cost, as well as reducing harmful environmental runoff. And this is just one of many stories of how our global developer community is making an impact in unexpected ways. Now, I'd like to bring up some colleagues to give updates across our developer platforms. Let's get started with what we're doing to make Android development easier. Please welcome Steph. As Sundar and Dave said, with 2 billion active devices on Android and 82 billion apps installed from Play, Android's momentum is amazing. What I like even more is how Android's momentum is making so many developers successful. The number of developers with over a million installs grew 35% just in the past year. And we're making it easier to grow revenue, too. In addition to credit cards, gift cards, everything else, we've expanded direct carrier billing to reach 900 million devices with over 140 operators. Altogether, the number of people buying on Play grew by almost 30% in the past year. Now, to support this vast ecosystem, we're working hard to help developers build great apps at every stage, writing your app, tuning, and growing your business. Today, we'll walk through four big themes. The first is languages. Next is making Android development faster and easier with the IDE and libraries. Third, we'll show you even more tools for building high quality experiences. Finally, we want to help you grow and reach new users, leveraging Android instant apps. So let's go straight in. We have been so excited to announce first class support for Kotlin. This starts now. In Android Studio, Kotlin support is now built in. We'll support building apps with as much Kotlin as you want, from 0 to 100%. Now, all of you who've written code in Kotlin know why we did this already. But for everyone, we did it because Kotlin is a beautiful programming language. We asked one Googler how he felt after writing, writing Kotlin for a couple of weeks. While I would never embarrass Adam Powell by using his, stage on, his name on stage, he said, I think I am in love. So many of you told me, Kotlin makes programming fun again, with so many wonderful features, like you're going to see here. And Tor will show you more in just a moment. As developers, 
Languages are the tools we use to express our thoughts. With Kotlin, there's just so much less syntactic noise that stands between what I want to say and how I say it. Now, for those of you who are wondering what this may mean for the Java programming language and C++, our commitment there is unchanged. We're adding Kotlin and enhancing our existing languages. For instance, in Android Studio, Java 8 features are now directly supported with the Java C compiler. And we've added more Java 8, 8 language APIs in O. So if you wish, you can ignore Kotlin completely, and your existing language support will keep getting better. But <laughs> if you can't wait to get started with Kotlin, it is incredibly easy. Kotlin works 100% with the Java programming language, which means it is completely interoperable. That means you can keep every line of code in your existing project. You can seamlessly call from Kotlin into the Java programming language and back, which means it is very easy to get started. You can add as little as a single Kotlin class. Another reason why Kotlin is such an amazing fit for Android is it's mature and production ready. Kotlin has been around for five years, and major apps like Flipboard, Pinterest, Squarecash, Expedia, and more are all using Kotlin in production. Now, Kotlin's not just a great language. It has outstanding IDE support. The team that brought you Kotlin is the same team behind IntelliJ, which, as you know, is what powers Android Studio, our IDE. Finally, Android has committed to Kotlin as a first-class language. And as you heard, we're announcing our plans to partner with JetBrains to move Kotlin into a nonprofit foundation. Kotlin is already open source under Apache 2, which means it is open and will remain open. We love how Kotlin fits with our ethos around community. And now Tor would love to show you Kotlin in action. So Tor. Thanks, Steph. So here's a pretty typical data class with three properties implemented in Java. As you can see, there is a lot of boilerplate code here with fields, getters, setters, equals hash code, and so on. Let's take a look at how we would implement this in Colin. So I'm going to go and delete this class. And now I'm going to write the equivalent Kotlin code. So here's the first line. And that is also the last line. That is all you have to write. This code. This code is completely equivalent to the 87 lines I just deleted. The compiler does all the work. It generates the same code as before, plus some extra goodies. So from Java, I can call into my new Kotlin class and access the same getters as before. But look what happens in Kotlin. Here we have a really nice property syntax. So I can, for example, use assignment to assign to this property instead of calling a setter. Now, as you're starting out with Kotlin, you might find yourself stuck realizing you don't know how to do something. So let's say that I'm about to do some image processing, and I realize that I don't know how to declare a two-dimensional array. Well, what I can do is open up a Java file, write the code in Java, which I know how to do, go back to Kotlin, and look what happens when I paste. That's right, the IDE converts it for me. That is a, it's a huge help when you're starting out. So as Steph can attest, I could literally stand for three hours and tell you all the things I love about Colin, and I think I have. Yes. Uh, but we don't have time for that. So instead, I will encourage you all to come to our excellent talks on Friday, where you learn everything you need to know to get started with Colin. And I hope you'll love coding in Colin as much as I do. Thanks, Tor. Thanks. For us on Android, adding Kotlin feels like a moment in history. We're excited today. It's just the beginning, though. We're even more excited about the possibilities that Kotlin creates for the future. But there's more. Our second theme is making development faster and easier with our tools and libraries. Android Studio is our official IDE. It is purpose-built for Android. And we keep increasing investment. Today, we're releasing Android Studio 3.0's first canary, focusing on speed and smarts and Android platform support, plus new libraries for app architecture. So let's go straight to a demo. This is more fun. All right, so here I have Android Studio 3.0. 
and I've just uh, built and deployed my app. And what you'll see are the new profilers, CPU, memory, and network. So I'm just going to open the app. And let me do a little bit of network here so you can see it on the graph. What you can see is the network profiler. And it's really cool that you can see all of the requests. But particularly cool would be if you could click and see the actual payload of the request. Even better than that would be if you could look and see the headers. But I actually think it would be very cool if you could click on the call stack and select and go to the line of code. So those are the three new profilers. 3.0 also includes a preview feature for debugging any APK. So you can build in any IDE and debug in Android Studio, including using these profilers for Java code. So to say more on speed and smarts, your feedback has made driving down sync and build time our number one priority. Benchmarking with a real-life 100-module project since 2.2, the build config time has dropped from three seconds down, or sorry, from three minutes down to two seconds, and we will keep working on build speed. On the emulators, we've added Play Store for Android testing, and there's so much more here. The next thing I want to talk about is Android platform support. You will find awesome features for Android and O, like end-to-end uh, -end instant app support, O system images and tons of helper tools. For instance, Dave talked about adaptive icons, which we all need to build now. So our team has built tools that make that easy. And one of my personal favorite features is to download Android dependencies for build. You don't have to go through the Android SDK manager anymore. We're now distributing through our own Maven repository. <laughs> Finally. You have asked us to make Android frameworks easier, like providing an opinionated guide to best practices or a better way of dealing with life cycles. We're launching a preview of new architecture components, libraries for common tasks. This starts with libraries for the view model pattern, data storage, and managing activity and fragment life cycles. We would love if you download and try all of this today. Now, as we move from coding, over into how to tune your quality and grow, I'd like you to hear from Ellie Powers. Please welcome Ellie. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. As all of you know, building a successful business on Play starts with a high quality app. And you've told us that sometimes you need to target the right devices in, in order to ensure the best user experience. So we're making it easier to understand Android's devices and target them in the Play Console. Now you can browse a detailed device catalog. No more searching for specs one device at a time. If you need a certain amount of RAM or you have a problem with a specific system on a chip, you can now set targeting rules to address that. Before excluding devices, you can even see your installs, rating, and revenue per device. Now, ensuring quality experiences really matters. The Play team took a sample of apps and analyzed the correlation between app quality and business success. When apps move from average to good quality, we saw an amazing six-fold increase in spend and a seven-fold increase in retention. That is phenomenal. We are always looking for new ways to bring users to your apps, and Instant Apps is our big bet in this area. Last year, we previewed Android Instant Apps. Instant Apps allows you to experience everything you love about apps, but without the hurdle of installation. Since then, we've been working with partners to refine the product. They have launched 50 Instant Apps, from immersive video with Vimeo, to mobile commerce with Jet, to apartment hunting with hot pads. And while it's still early days, developers are reporting positive results. For example, Jet, Hotpads, and Vimeo are seeing double-digit increases in purchases, leads generated, and videos watched. So today, we are opening up Android Instant Apps to all Android developers. This means anyone. Thank you. This means anyone can now build and publish an Instant App. 
feedback from our partners has shaped the development tools that we're making available to all Android developers today. Let's take a look. You build instant apps in Android Studio 3.0. Many of you wondered if building an instant app means maintaining two forks of your code, right? The answer is no. You can use exactly the same code for your instant app and your installable app. Your instant app is downloaded as needed, feature by feature. So you'll organize your project into feature modules and then use that code in both your in in instant app and your installable app. Now we know refactoring your app into features can sometimes be a bit of a pain, so we're providing tools to ease the process. For example, the new modularized refactoring action helps you move code and resources between modules. Every app is different, but we've seen with our early partners that instant app development typically takes about four to six weeks with the latest tools. As you all know, the faster your product is, the more usage you'll get. So you'll want each module to load as quickly as possible. We're providing optimization tools, from space-saving shared libraries, to more efficient asset delivery, to on-the-wire compression. And when you're ready, you'll just upload your instant app APKs together with your installable APK in the Play Console. If you're getting ready to build for Android O, we're introducing new APIs and behaviors for instant apps. There's a new, more efficient runtime sandbox. And users will be able to find instant apps directly in the launcher and then add them to their home screens. Let's look at an example. I heard about the New York Times crossword app recently. And I can search for it in the launcher and then open it with a single tap. I can even drag it to the home screen so it's easy to come back later. By the way, in early testing, the Times is seeing significantly more engagement from people playing and completing puzzles. To get started building an instant app today, go to g.co slash instant apps and come visit us at our I.O. sessions or at the Android Sandbox. With Android in so many places, it's enabled us to create new types of experiences, like a Google Assistant, bringing Google's intelligence to billions of people. It's been really cool to see the Assistant really coming to life and rolling out on so many devices this year. Next up, we'll learn what the Google Assistant means to you as a developer from Brad Abrams. Thank you. Thanks, Ellie. In December last year, we launched an early version of the Actions on Google developer platform. This version lets you build apps for Google Home. But since then, we've been focused on growing your audience, expanding the platform feature set, and improving the developer experience. As you heard in the keynote this morning, your apps are now available to Google Assistant users across Android and the iPhone. And as we continue to expand the Assistant's reach to more surfaces, the developer platform will follow. With apps for the Assistant now available on the phone, you'll have the opportunity to grow your user base. But more importantly, you'll be able to build apps for entirely new assistive use cases, things that previously weren't well suited to a voice-only interface, such as shopping for clothes or ordering food from a lengthy menu. In addition, with our new UI elements, such as image carousels, lists, and suggestion chips, users can easily get things done with your app. They can seamlessly transition between voice, typing, and taps, all in the same conversation. You can build and deploy apps for the assistant on the phone starting today. Thank you. We also want to make it easy to complete purchases through the Assistant to help you grow your business. We designed the transaction experience on the Assistant to be easy and lightweight for users and developers alike. You heard about transactions this morning from Valerie, but let me expand a little bit from a developer point of view. For payments, you can choose to use Google Facilitated Payments which are easy to integrate, allow you to leverage hundreds of millions of cards that users have already stored with Google and are available to developers for free. Or you can choose to use a payment method that users have already provided you. To do so, we recommend using our new seamless account linking support. 
That allows users to sign in to an existing account or even create a new account in just two taps. However, the transaction isn't over when a user pays. Users may want to check on the status of an order, modify an order, or even reorder an item. That's why the Assistant now allows users to see all their transactions in a single history view. Finally, we built a new orders update feature to make it easy for users to re-engage with your app. You're now able to send status updates to users asynchronously, like, for example, when a car arrives to pick them up, when their food is delivered, or when a prescription is ready. You can start building and testing transactional apps today, and they'll be available to Google Assistant users on the phone soon. But what good are these transactional features if users can't discover your app? Today, we're rolling out a new app directory. Users can access it with a single tap from the Google Assistant. It not only has categories and user ratings, it also allows users to try your app right from the directory page. Users can also create a shortcut to your app for an easy way to invoke it. For example, instead of saying, OK, Google, ask Forecaster Joe what's the surf report for the Outer Banks, you can just say your shortcut. OK, Google, is the surf up? Each app's directory page is also shareable on the web so that you can promote your app to new users and your existing users can share it with their friends. And to make finding your app easier, the assistant is also learning from the directory and other information provided by the developer. Thanks to these additional signals, the assistant can often present users with a few different options for general requests like play a game. While we're confident these features will help improve discoverability of your apps, our work is not done. Improving discoverability is important to all of us, and you can expect ongoing investments and improvements in this area. We're equally invested in providing a great developer experience. Today, we're launching a new developer console. The Actions console helps you work better as a team, collect data about your app's usage, performance, and discovery patterns. This new console is well integrated with Firebase and the Google Cloud Console, so you can easily share data with your apps. In addition to the brand new console, we're also providing you access to developer tools that let you quickly and easily build apps for the assistant. Since launching our platform, we work with an expanding number of developer tools companies to make their solutions compatible with actions on Google. We're also expanding the capabilities of API.ai, our own conversation building tool, launching new features such as follow-up intents, pre-built agents, and in-dialogue analytics. While we're still at the early days of the actions on Google Platform, we're focused on making it robust and expanding its reach and capabilities. We're soon launching the platform in UK English, with French and German and other languages following later this year. We also intend to bring the platform to many new devices, including all those powered by the Google Assistant SDK. We're excited about the road ahead, and we want more of you to join us by developing for the platform. With an addressable audience of 100 million devices, new capabilities like transactions, and improved developer experience, we think this is an incredible opportunity for all of us. You know, the magic of the assistant is enabled by Google's deep investments in AI and the cloud. And to tell you more about how you can use that directly, please welcome Fei Fei. Thank you. Hi. I'm Fei-Fei Li. I'm Chief Scientist of AI and Machine Learning at Google Cloud. What an exciting day. I've been doing AI research for almost two decades. And I can honestly say, these last few years have been the most exciting of my entire career. 
AI is transforming everything Google does. And as we speak, industries from finance to healthcare are augmenting human capabilities with machine insights. But building AI expertise is a significant investment. And we know that many of you simply haven't had the opportunity. I joined Google precisely for this reason, to ensure that everyone can leverage AI to stay competitive and solve the problems that matter most to them. In other words, we're meeting you where you are. We call this democratizing AI. And I'd like to share a few examples in action. First, we're develop, uh, democratizing the algorithms that make AI so powerful with a collection of high-level machine learning APIs that can help your applications understand the content of images, videos, audios, and natural language with minimal efforts. Whatever your level of expertise, these are tools you can put to use immediately and see results. At the same time, we're equally focused on developers ready to build their own models. In November 2015, Google open sourced TensorFlow, a software framework for machine learning that is used extensively throughout Google. Today, we're continuing the evolution by bringing new high-level APIs in TensorFlow 1.2 that makes it easier for you to start training machine learning models on your data right away using the best hardware you have available. I encourage you to check out our TensorFlow sessions to learn more. Additionally, we also launched the cloud machine learning engine to help you manage large-scale TensorFlow training and prediction jobs in the cloud. Of course, there's no getting around the fact that AI requires enormous computational resources. And this represents one of the steepest barriers to entry for developers. To address this, Sundar announced this morning that Google has developed a second generation TPU, or Tensor Processing Unit, that can train machine learning models as well as run them. Our TPUs deliver a staggering 180 teraflops and are built for just the kind of number crunching that drives machine learning today. To put this in perspective, our new large-scale translation model takes a full day to train on 32 of the world's best commercially available GPUs while only one-eighth of a TPU pod can do this just in an afternoon. But TPU specs are only part of the story. The real breakthrough lie in how we're working to democratize computation as a whole. Google Cloud Platform allows us to make this incredible new hardware available to everyone. You'll soon be able to rent cloud TPUs without any upfront capital expenses, the same way you can rent other infrastructures on Google Compute Engine, pay only for what you need. We strive to ensure consistent experiences and painless interoperability. Whether you're running your code on CPUs, GPUs, TPUs, or whatever comes next. If you're interested in being one of the first developers to train machine learning models and cloud TPUs, please sign up at this link to learn more about our cloud TPU alpha programs. I see all the cell phones. <laughs> As an AI researcher myself, I can tell you 
that the research implications of TPUs are significant as well, which is why I'm so excited also about the TensorFlow Research Cloud, a cluster of 1,000 cloud TPUs that we're making available to top machine learning researchers for free. As an example, we share the news about our cloud TPUs with Harvard Medical School. And they're eager to use our TensorFlow Research Cloud to do research at a national scale that just hasn't been possible till now. We're setting up a program to accept applications for access to the TensorFlow Research Cloud. And you can sign up to learn more about this. I especially encourage students and Kaggle users to apply. These are exciting times. Google has spent years developing some of the most advanced AI in the world. And the emergence of the cloud means you can share it with everyone, from startups to enterprises, from healthcare to retail, and everything in between. We created the cloud AI team to make AI democratic, to meet you where you are with Google's most powerful AI tools, and to share the journey as you put them to use. Whether you're building state-of-the-art machine learning models from scratch, or just want turnkey solutions for immediate results, we're here to support you at every step of the way. Now, to tell you more about how Google is improving development for the web, please welcome Tao. Thank you. Thanks, Fei-Fei. Hi, everyone. I'm Tal from the Chrome team. And I'm excited to tell you about some of the great improvements we've made on the web over this last year. The web is big. With over 2 billion instances of Chrome, we know that the web has tremendous reach. But one of the real strengths of the web is that it's bigger than a single browser. Various estimates show that there are well over 5 billion actively used devices. And regardless of whether that device is a smartphone or a laptop or a desktop or a tablet, they all have a browser. And that means that any web app is available on these billions of devices today. And we've seen this have a real impact on how many users web apps are reaching. We've all seen how quickly mobile has been growing. And native apps have been growing at a tremendous pace with it. But what's really remarkable is that even with the web's large initial reach, we've seen the average monthly web audience growing even faster. And because of this growth, we're seeing the web expand into new areas, with experiences like WebVR being built on the web platform. And the web continues to pop up in more and more places, even some we didn't really expect. A couple of weeks ago, McDonald's announced that they used the web and Polymer to build their new menu boards. So now when you're looking at the menu at McDonald's, that's built on the web as well. So with the web pretty much everywhere, we're constantly trying to push the boundaries on what it can do. If you look at all of our launches since last year's I.O., we've shipped 215 additional APIs that cover a range of capabilities, from making it easier to integrate payments into your experience to making it possible to build fully capable offline media experiences directly on the web. And with all of these new capabilities, we've seen a massive growth in experiences built on the web. Accelerated mobile pages, or AMP pages, make it really easy for publishers to easily create fast articles. And since launch, we've seen this grow to over 2 billion AMP pages from across 900,000 domains. And beyond AMP pages, the modern mobile web also allows developers to build deep, rich mobile experiences with something that we call progressive web apps, or PWAs. PWAs are about helping web developers leverage the web's new capabilities to build high-class experiences that feel immersive. They can load quickly and work offline and can even send notifications to users. And we've seen a number of amazing experiences taking advantage of these new capabilities. 
As just one example, there's Twitter, who recently rebuilt their mobile web experience. Here, they have a polished, fast, immersive experience that works on any connection type. And it can send users notifications. And it's completely built on the mobile web, so it's already accessible on billions of devices. And with an immersive experience like this, we also want to make sure that users can get back to it easily. Add to Home Screen has always allowed users to add any experience on the web directly to their Android home screen. But with our improved Add to Home Screen flow, when you add a PWA to your home screen, it's fully integrated into the platform. So to users, it feels like any other app experience on their device. It'll appear in the Android launcher alongside your Android apps, and it'll even appear in Android storage settings. But since it's a PWA, it's inherently smaller, with Twitter's progressive web app at under one megabyte. So users are getting a comparable experience that requires significantly less storage space. And the fact that it's so small doesn't just reduce its storage size, but also means that it loads almost instantly on any connection type. And this fast, integrated, improved add to home screen flow is rolling out now. With all of these new capabilities, we've also been working to make sure it's really easy for web developers to build these experiences. We'll be going into a lot more detail on how to develop PWAs throughout the mobile web track over the next few days. But no matter how you're building your web app, Lighthouse is a tool that can show you how to improve your web experience. Lighthouse is a Chrome extension and command line tool that runs almost 100 audits on your site to identify how you can improve your app's performance, accessibility, and progressive web appiness. And we're excited to announce that Lighthouse will be integrated directly into DevTools. So now you can quickly see how your website is doing and what to do next directly in Chrome. And with all of these tools, we've seen just how easy it can be for companies to take advantage of these new capabilities for their web experience. To give one example, there's WeGo, one of the biggest travel players in Southeast Asia and the Middle East that built one of the most polished PWAs we've seen. Their experience works quickly, whether you're online or offline. They link off to AMP pages to ensure that pages load quickly as well. And they leverage some of the newest web APIs to make payments and identity really easy for their users. But what's really remarkable is that this core PWA experience was built in just over two months by a single engineer who was new to web development. And this is just one example of many. Leveraging the modern mobile web is now the norm around the world. We've seen companies everywhere building progressive web apps and seeing a tangible impact on their key metrics. With the modern mobile web, it's possible to easily build immersive, fully capable experiences that can reach billions of people around the world today. And now, let's turn our focus to what we're doing to help make it easier to develop apps and grow your business. Please join me in welcoming Ben. Thanks, Tal. Hey, everyone. Last year at I.O., we introduced an expanded Firebase, a mobile development platform that helps you with things like storing data in the cloud and synchronizing it across devices, pinpointing app crashes, sending targeted notifications to just the right users, serving ads in your apps, and more. All of this is bundled together in a single, easy-to-use, cross-platform SDK. Firebase also includes a powerful free and unlimited analytics tool purpose-built for the needs of native apps. And new this year, analytics gives you real-time views into what's happening inside of your app, which opens up sort of a live window into what's happening right now. Firebase is also integrated with the Google Cloud Platform, which means it scales with you as your needs grow. For example, analytics connects seamlessly with BigQuery, which means you can execute fast SQL-like queries over your data at scale. Since last year's launch, over a million developers are using Firebase. We are so humbled that so many of you have taken this journey with us and have chosen to use us in your app. We're deeply committed to Firebase, and we're doubling down on our efforts to simplify more everyday developer challenges. To that end, in January, the Fabric team joined Google. 
Since first launching Crashlytics in 2011, the Fabric team has been on a similar mission to ours and have built a remarkable set of products that have achieved widespread developer adoption. The Firebase and Fabric teams are hard at work integrating these two platforms together in a thoughtful way to bring you the best of both. We'll have more to share on this front in the coming months. Over the past year, we've been continuously improving and expanding Firebase. And today, I want to highlight a couple of the enhancements that we've made, starting with cloud functions. One of our goals with Firebase is freeing you from having to think about servers and infrastructure so that you can focus on creating great apps. But something's been missing for us to truly accomplish this goal. And it's a gap that we're now able to fill with cloud functions for Firebase, which we just recently released into beta. Cloud Functions gives you an easy way to deploy JavaScript code into the cloud. And this deployed code is automatically mapped to a URL, but it can also integrate with Firebase events. And these functions are run in a managed Node.js environment, so you can easily tap in to the vast Node package ecosystem. You can use these functions to do things like respond to a database update by sending a notification with cloud messaging. Or you can resize images uploaded by your users before saving them with cloud storage. And today, we're opening up a new integration between functions and Firebase hosting. Now, hosting lets you serve static content like HTML and CSS files that are automatically backed by a global caching network. By combining this with cloud functions, you can now generate dynamic web content that you can serve on your own domain with the static content and is both accelerated by this global caching network. So with Cloud Functions, you can deploy individual units of code as you need them, which gives you a really elegant way to factor code out from your apps and share them across your web and native apps as you need without having to worry about app servers or server-side applications. And it enables true serverless development. We are really excited about this. All right, I've got one more thing I want to share with you. And this has to do with your native apps quality. As developers, we spend a lot of time optimizing and testing our apps to get them to perform just right. But once we release them into the wild, it's really only our users who know how well they're performing. That's because it's pretty hard to know exactly how they're behaving across a huge array of devices and widely variable network conditions across the world. And not having our apps perform well is frustrating for everyone. So today, I'm pleased to share that we're releasing a new product to help called Firebase Performance Monitoring. After you add Firebase Performance, thank you, after you add Firebase Performance to your app with one line of code, Firebase Performance automatically provides insights into two of the most critical aspects of app performance, startup time and network responsiveness. You can then use its simple API, thank you, you can use its simple API to measure virtually anything in your app. As you see on the slide, you just invoke a function at the beginning and then at the end, and Firebase Performance does the heavy lifting of collecting all of the performance metrics for you across all of your app instances. And then you can filter these metrics by country, device type, OS, and app version to get a clear view of where you need to focus your efforts. The beta version of Firebase Performance is available today. Thank you. We hope this makes a big difference in your efforts to create high-performing native apps. We have a bunch of other Firebase announcements today at sessions here at I.O., including support for phone number authentication. And we're open sourcing many of our Firebase SDKs. Thanks to new enhancements, we've also made the Firebase Test Lab for Android and our recently released Unity and C++ SDKs. Firebase is great for games developers, too. We want Firebase to be the best place for you to start your next app, freeing your energies to focus on making your app awesome, which is where you should be spending all your time. Thank you. And now I'd like to bring Jason back up. Thanks, Ben. As you can see, at Google, we have been working across a range of teams to make it easier to build products. During I.O., you'll have an opportunity to go deep into a number of these, with 14 content tracks and over 140 breakout sessions. 
covering everything from Android to the cloud to VR. We also have sandboxes to help you get hands-on experience with our products, as well as over 70 code labs to get you up and running with our latest APIs today. In addition, the Googlers that built these products are here. So grab them for one-on-one -on -one consultations in office hours or at the sandboxes. Not only can they help you understand our products, but more importantly, they can get your feedback on how we're doing. I do have one other announcement before we go out to breakout sessions. As you can tell, we're really excited about the future of AI, and particularly our Google Assistant platform. And so to get you ramped up, we're hosting our first ever Actions on Google uh, Developer Challenge. By building creative, useful, or simply fun apps for the Google Assistant, you can compete to win one of over 20 prizes. And for those of you here at Shoreline, we're giving you a Google Home device and $700 of cloud credit to get you started. We, we cannot wait to see what you build. So Sundar talked about the technological shift to AI, as well as the power of open platforms. It's a really exciting time in computing. We hope you're as inspired as we are about the future. And remember, all of us here at Google are here to help you this week. So please take advantage of it. And let's build great things together. Thank you, and have fun.
Hello and welcome to Google I.O. 2017. I'm Timothy Jordan and I'll be here between sessions to guide you around the in-person experiences at the festival. That's right, even though you're joining remotely, this year you'll get an in-depth look at everything happening on the ground. Have a question about I.O. 17? Tweet it our way today through the 19th using hashtag I.O. 17 request and a team of Googlers will be on site tracking down answers for you. You just saw our developer keynote where Jason Titus led you through our investments in tools and services for developers. That's you. It's our goal to simplify repetitive tasks like dealing with user login, analytics, or synchronizing real-time data. We're providing tools to make it easier to solve these and other everyday problems in simple and powerful ways. And we want to help you build amazing new experiences with machine learning, VR, and voice-enabled interactions. Let's review a handful of the announcements you just heard along those lines. Android is officially supporting the Kotlin programming language, in addition to the Java language and C++. Kotlin is a brilliantly designed, mature, production-ready language that we believe will make Android development faster and more fun. Android Studio 3.0 Canary is our new preview that includes three major features to accelerate the development flow a new suite of app performance profiling tools to quickly diagnose performance issues, support for the Kotlin programming language, and increased Gradle build speeds for large-sized app projects. With Firebase, we're providing more insights to understand app performance through a new product, Firebase Performance Monitoring. We're also introducing integration between hosting and cloud functions, adding support for phone number authentication, and improving analytics. Oh, and we've also started open sourcing our SDKs. We've introduced new innovations for you to make it easy for your users to pay for services with the Google Payment API, to build profitable businesses with a completely redesigned ad mob, and to grow a user base with universal app campaigns. There are several powerful new features and reports in the Play Console to help you improve your app's performance, manage releases with confidence, reach a global audience, and grow your business. Android Instant Apps is a new way to run Android apps without requiring installation. Now anyone can build and publish an Instant App. There are also more than 50 new experiences available for users to try out from a variety of brands such as Jet, New York Times, Vimeo, and Zillow. And finally, we're adding two new certifications for web developers, the Mobile Sites Certification and the Mobile Web Specialist Certification. Those are some of the highlights. Check out our Google Developers blog for a more in-depth recap of this afternoon's announcements. We have 14 content tracks with over 140 breakout sessions all live streamed. And in between them all, I'll be your all access pass with sandbox tours, interviews, and even a peek or two at the parties. Tune into the live stream on google.com slash IO, catch me in between sessions on any of the live stream channels, and follow the conversation on hashtag IO17. This is Google IO 2017.
Hello and welcome to What's New in Android, or as I, the only person, like to refer to it as the Android Keynote. I'm Chet Haas from the Android UI Toolkit team. And I'm Romain Guy for the graphics team. Uh, and I'm Dan Sandler from the System UI team. Uh, and we don't have a lot of time, so let's get to it. Are you ready for What's New in Android? Um, here's where we left off last time. API 25, so we're just going to grab that git SHA there, hop it into git diff, and then, all right, off we go. Um, you're going to want to write this down. OK. Um, Next. Yeah, that was a good one. Right. OK. I love yeah. those. Oh, man, remember we almost made that in enum? It was hilarious. Um, you got that? Uh, <laughs> You think this is what people came for? I don't know why we didn't think of this before. Um, so we've, we've been doing this talk. We've been telling you what's new for, for years. And you can see that I forgot my blazer. Uh, actually, no, I had a lovely red blazer, but somebody borrowed it for the keynote. Uh, and you've got your um, it, it looks like you're menacing shirt. me. <laughs> um, and, but this year, it was a little different, right? You, you had uh, developer previews well in advance. So you've seen a lot of these APIs before. Um, you had the Google keynote, uh, where we showed off a lot of really exciting stuff. Uh, we had a developer keynote, um, where you learned about even more developer stuff. So what, what are we doing here? What is the point of what's new in Android? Existential crisis. <laughs> so did you test this clicker? I did. Okay. I did. Think, of this talk, think of this talk like a wine tasting or a whiskey flight or one of those soda machines that you can push all the buttons on. Um, this is an artisanal, hand-picked selection of things you may have overlooked uh, in the new release of Android, um, things you're going to need to do no matter what to be part of Android O, and, well, honestly, just things we'd like to talk about when we're on stage. So um, with that, this is really what's new in Android specifically, what you might have missed in the developer preview or the I.O. keynote or the other keynote and why you should care. One last thing that I want to make sure we get to today is this. Everybody's always excited about this. But we're going to hold that for the end. It's going to be good. All right, let's get started. Roman, talk about UI and graphics. Yes, let's start. So uh, the first feature we want to talk about is one that you saw this morning in one of the keynotes. Chad, this clicker does not work. You didn't test it. Oh. <laughs> you know, Wasting time. you know, I'm going to stand back here, and I'm going to do the slides for you. All right. Go to the next slide. This please. is why they didn't want to give us a clicker. Right. So a feature. <laughs> it works for me. Just go back there. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to see you. Uh, so the first feature that you saw uh, this morning in one of the keynotes, picture in picture, it's not just for TV anymore. It's also for your phone. So here we have an example of a third party application, Netflix, running on your phone, picture in picture. Give me that clicker. <laughs> Let's move back. Uh, there we go. And it's really, easy to, it's really easy to implement in your application. You just have to modify your manifest. And stop playing the animation, please. Um, you just have to say support picture in picture true. You don't need in O the resizable activity true attribute anymore. And you should also test configuration changes. And in your code, when you want to enter the picture in picture mode, you just have one line to call. You get your activity, and you call enter picture in picture. Super simple, and it's going to make your user super happy. Then uh, a feature that's very dear to my heart, it's color management. So we're adding support for white gamut displays in O. It's not going to be on all devices. Only devices that support the feature uh, will enable it for, the, for your application. We're adding support for 16-bit PNG files, so you can have uh, wider colors, more saturated colors. We support ICC profiles, so color profiles embedded in bitmaps, in JPEGs, PNGs, and WebPs. It will ensure accurate rendition of colors across mul multiple screens. We also have a bunch of new APIs, but we're going to talk about that more at the end of the week in a different talk. So because the picture is worth a thousand words, this is color management and how it works. I uh, hope it's clear. <laughs> But really, the, the color management is about something you've probably experienced with your own application. Your colors look different across devices, so we have solutions for you in Android O. So if you want to know more, there's going to be a talk that I'm going to give on Friday at 11.30 in st on stage two. It's called Understanding Color. Next, we're also adding support for multiple displays. If your application is already that clicker is horrible. <laughs> if, your, if your application supports multiple windows already, the multi-window mode, it already supports multiple display in O. 
uh, when a phone is connected or, or an Android device is connected to multiple dis uh, displays and you have an application that's compatible, the user can choose to send your application on a different display. When this happens, you're going to get a resizing, uh, act uh, resizing configuration change. You can also control on what display your activity shows up. Uh, you can use the activity options for that. And you should really test your app if you want to support this feature. To help you with testing, we have two new developer tools. You can run ADB Shell Dumpsys Display. It will list all the current available displays on the device. And if you call ADB Shell Start with your activity intent, you can specify the display on which you want to start the activity. It's a very easy way for you to test this. Uh, there's a lot more to those APIs, uh, so we encourage you to go to the office hours on Friday and Thursday, uh, the, the office hours for Windows and activities. Next, media. So uh, we, we have a lot of very useful classes in our media package. We have the media player, the media recorder, the extractor, and the codec. And we added a new get metrics API on every one of those classes. It helps you query information about the media that you're dealing with. So you can query the resolution, the codec, the bitrate, uh, the duration, this kind of data. It's super easy to use. Just call get metrics on one of those objects. You get the persistable bundle, and you can look up the uh, documentation on developer.android.com to know what kind of queries are available. Playback is also much improved. You now have control over the buffering in your application. So you can specify a low and a high watermark. So the, the playback of the video will not st start until you reach the low watermark, and the system will do its best to keep uh, cache data between the slow and high watermark. And you can specify the watermarks in duration or amount of data in, uh, in size. We also improved seeking. So when you seek into a video, you can now choose the behavior. Do you want to seek to the, the closest frame, to the, cl to the next keyframe, to the previous keyframe, or to the cl closest sync frame? And finally, we made, uh, we made DRM playback with the white vine a lot easier to use in all of your applications. For recording, uh, until now, the media mixer uh, only, let, let you, uh, only lets you add, uh, sorry, add one video track and or one audio track. Now you can have as many audio and video tracks as you want. You can also create custom tracks. Uh, the MIME type has to start with application slash, and it's basically a sideband where you can encode any kind of data you want. So uh, a canonical example is to encode gyroscope data if you want to be able to replay a 360 video or something like that. WebView comes with uh, really useful new APIs. Uh, we've added the, the ability to use safe browsing that uh, you, you know and love from Chrome that detects malwares and uh, unsecure web pages. So if you add this tag in your manifest, this metadata tag, it's going to use the same backend and the same API that Chrome itself uses to uh, secure the, uh, the browsing experience for your users. The WebView uses now multiple processes, and in particular, there's a render process. So we also have new APIs to deal with those multi-processes. So if well, the render process crashes, you can use the termination handle API to detect the crash and decide what to do in your application. You can crash your application if you want. You can try to restart the WebView, or you can just lock something and show a message to the user. It's much more graceful than before. You can also use the renderer importance API to better deal with the low memory situations. So when the system is low on memory, it's going to try to reclaim you know, RAM from somewhere. And you can tell the system whether your web view is very important or not that important to your application. So if the web view is critical to your application, you should definitely take a look at this API. So you know it's the right button, right? Yes, I know that. <laughs> So there were a couple of long requested features for animators, specifically for animator sets. Um, they were deceptively tricky to implement, so it took a while. Uh, but now in Android O, we have the capability in animator sets of having seeking. So now if you have an animator that's a collection of child animators, you can seek within those child animators in the overall animator set. So yay. Uh, we also have the ability uh, to reverse. <laughs> hey, Chet. Didn't you try to implement those APIs a while ago? Maybe. Uh huh. And who <laughs> implemented the APIs in the end? Not me. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> so new capability again in animator set to reverse. So you no longer have to, you know, set up a separate animator set with all that functionality and get a listener and all that. We do all that tedious work for you. Uh, so yay. Uh, autofill, because it's really tedious to get all that information correct over and over. We saw this in the keynote earlier. Uh, it's the ability to, uh, you've got a form to fill in. There's uh, a provider that can give you that information. So when you get those text fields, we can automatically enter that information for you. 
And there are a couple of different aspects to this. One is that you can certainly implement your own service and provide that capability, or depend on service that we are providing instead. Or more typically, you will implement a client of that. The standard views just work. If you're using text view, if you're using edit text, we know how to receive this information, interact with the service already. Uh, so you don't need to do anything for standard views. If you're using custom views, or if you want to provide more information about standard views, we have APIs for providing uh, hints to us about what the the value types are, as well as APIs to tell us more about your custom views and how you want to interact with that. Um, also, if you have a, a custom view hierarchy, let's say you have a surface view uh, where you have views inside of there, but all we know is that there's a surface view, then there are APIs for you to tell us about the virtual hierarchy that you want us to interact with. There is going to be more about this in a session on Friday morning, so go to that if you want to learn more about autofill. And now let's talk a little bit about text. There's been a bunch of stuff going on in the text arena this time. Uh, I think we can rewrite this. There we go. <laughs> I only use that font because it, it hurts Dan. It just physically hurts him. It's awesome. I think you broke him. All right, so first of all, um, you can uh, use XML to declare font information using sort of a, a neat hack in, with data binding, but it's uh, kind of tricky to do, and why shouldn't we actually provide that capability for you? So now we do. So you can now actually put a font file directly in this new resource font directory. <laughs> Yay, indeed. Uh, so put that in the directory, or you can tell us about the font family, so you can provide several fonts with information about the styles of each, and then you can just use those directly as you could any other resource. Uh, and from code, you just say, give me that resource, and away you go. Uh, downloadable fonts, now we have the capability for you to declare a font that you want to use that we will then download and cache on the system for you if it is not there yet. Or if it is on the system, then we'll use it from the cache. You can do this from code or from XML and use it as a resource, just like you did in XML fonts on the previous exciting slide. And we also have a font provider that we are providing in a not yet released version of Google Play Services. There is a beta version of that available at the conference this week. I don't know the details on that, but there's a session where you can learn the details, or you should be able to go to the Play Service services website to learn more about that. Um, and this gives you access to all of Google Fonts. So if you just want to use one of the standard ones, such as that beautiful font I used to kick off this section, maybe that's in there, uh, then you can uh, ask for that directly from the service. Uh, also, there's the ability to have auto-sizing text view. So typically, if you resize a text view, you never know what's going to be like the hit. Right? Text. Text is Text. cool, especially when it's in the right font. So what you get now is the behavior on the left there, where we're just resizing the view itself. There's no change to the, the font. But on the right, if you opt into the auto-sizing text view behavior, then we're going to resize the font for you. And you can specify the behavior, the step increments that you want to use, or the specific sizes that you want to snap to as it resizes. So there's APIs for that. There's APIs in both XML as well as uh, Java programming language codes. Um, so knock yourself out. And for all of these text features, XML fonts, downloadable fonts, and auto-sizing text view, they're talking about all of these in the What's New in Support Library session tomorrow morning. And you're wondering, why are they talking about it in a Support Library session? Aren't these O platform APIs? Yes, they are. And they are also in Support Library. So you can use all of these capabilities going back on earlier releases. Accessibility service utilities. If you're writing an accessibility service, it's a great thing to do. We have new capabilities that you can take advantage of. Language detection, the ability to put a button in the navigation bar along with the other buttons there to make it easier to access your stuff. Separate volume control for accessibility volume, so you're not conflating that volume with other volumes on the devices. And also the ability to define custom gestures custom fingerprint gestures. Uh, if you want to learn anything more about these, there's a session this afternoon on accessibility that you should check out. 
And finally, one of my favorite really tiny changes, I'm, I'm going to say tiny because it's one line of code for the API, for the actual CLs that went in to fix all the code that was dependent upon the former implementation was huge. So I don't want to detract from the work from it, but API-wise, really tiny, kind of hidden, kind of looks like the same thing from the outside. The way find view by ID used to be declared was something like this, public view, find view by ID, and then you call that, you pass in your resource ID and get back a view, and then you immediately cast it into what you want. So text view, you have to tell it's a text view on both the left and the right, and there's parentheses, and it's a big bother. People use uh, helper libraries just to get around the fact that this looks so horrible. So now, we have this. I call this feature Castaway. I think I am the only one that does so. <laughs> All right, blew past my first slide. That's fine. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the uh, UI, system UI stuff you're going to look at. Um, if you have an app, you're going to need to know about adaptive icons. Uh, I think this got like a barely a mention uh, in one of uh, Steph's slides earlier today. But essentially, this is tr we're trying to save you time and money. There are so many launchers out there, and each one of them has a different recommendation for the shape of your icon. So adaptive icons is a new piece of technology that we have brought to you uh, in O that allows you to say, here's my background, here's my foreground, cut it out to whatever shape you like. So even if the launcher has a circle, uh, or it's got a round rectangle, um, or it's got something awful, uh, you have an icon <laughs> that matches exactly uh, the, the, local, the local flavor. Uh, there's going to be a ton more information about adaptive icons uh, at a talk on Thursday. Um, and uh, definitely go to that one. Um, all right, let's talk about shortcuts and widgets, um, because Launcher is also a part of System UI. Previously, to get shortcuts and widgets on the user screen, you, there's, a, there's a broadcast for shortcuts that sort of kind of works. And for widgets, you just have to beg the user, please, please, see if you can find our widget inside the Launcher. Um, uh, in O, you can now actually request one of these things to be pinned to the user's workspace, uh, using Shortcut Manager for shortcuts, using App Widget Manager for widgets. And the user then gets the opportunity to say, no, I don't want that on my desktop, or yes, I do. And in fact, I will go ahead and place it exactly where I want it. Or they can just say, sure, find a spot for it, which was the previous behavior. So now you don't have to walk the user through a long flow. You just send them right into this dialog. It's super convenient. Look at all the new users you're going to have on your widgets. I can just say I'm pausing for applause when I'm really fussing with the clicker here. Um, this also we'll talk about on Thursday at 4.30. All right, notifications. You knew it was coming. Um, they're super useful. Uh, they're great for engagement. Users love them. They're, they're maybe a little out of control. There's a lot uh, that is being used in the notification stream right now, and it's very hard for you to get your message to the users that want it, and it's very hard for a user to manage the inflow uh, of demands on their attention. Um, if it's out of control now, the user should always be in control. That's been a principle of ours since the beginning. We added the ability to block notifications from a package in Jellybean. And Nougat, we refined a little bit and added quietening. Um, but all through all this, our users, the number one request we get from users is, OK, but can I just block some of an app's notifications? On the other hand, the number one request we get from developers is, could the user just block some of my notifications? It's the same thing. Everybody's been asking for the same thing. And this is where notification channels come from. It's a new API uh, in O. A channel is a name category of notifications from one app that all share this same behavior, vibration, sound, light, whether they pop up on screen, so that the user has explicit and fine-grained control. So as an app, you'll get to set up all your own channels, uh, defining the default behavior for, oh, a, a private message should pop up, and oh, uh, a, a tag maybe doesn't pop up, or it's got a lower priority. Uh, and then users, when they long press a notification or use the new slide gesture to look at it, they can see what channel it's on and make changes right there in line. Uh, once you target O, if you take nothing else away from my two minutes here, take away this, you have to use channels for every notification, or they will be dropped. So until you target O, you can start like, slowly evolving your notification system over to channels. Once you target O, they have to all be channelized, because we're trying to get to a consistent experience where the user knows what they're going to get. Um, and we're going to talk about that and a lot of other great stuff, including design considerations, all the code that I didn't put up there, whatever that little blinky thing is over there uh, on this talk uh, at 4.30 tomorrow.
There's a lot of other great stuff coming to System UI. Um, we have listed some of it here. It ran off the end. Again, I like doing that with slides. Um, and I encourage you very much to check out the developer previews or install the beta and play with all of it. We're really proud of it. All right, new APIs for you as developers. We expanded on the strict mode API that I'm sure you're all using in your debugging. So now on the thread policy, you can get warned when you're, not, when you're using unbuffered I.O. So if you use an input or an output stream without wrapping it into one of the buffered stream, you'll get a flash or whatever it is the, uh, the trigger warning you, you've set. On the VM policy, if you don't tag your sockets, you can also get warned. Tagging sockets is really useful to do traffic debugging using Android Studio. And finally, if you open uh, another intent, if you send an intent to outside of your application, and you need to grant permission, you can also be warned. So it's really easy to use. It looks like the, uh, the previous APIs we had. Media file access. So one of the, uh, we introduced the document providers uh, a while ago, in a, a couple of releases ago, and they're extremely useful, except when you have large documents. If you have a large document, you needed to download the entire data before you could pass it to the, to the callers, to the user of the, doc, of the document provider. So now you can create seekable file descriptors. It's extremely useful for audio, video, or any large type of content. It's also extremely use, easy to use. So you get a storage manager, you open a proxy file descriptor, you give it a callback, and then we're going to invoke your callback to request the size of the document, to request some amount of data uh, in a byte array, and then we're going to tell you when to close it. Cache data. Um, so this is uh, new APIs that the system gives you to be a better citizen. So each app has a certain amount of data it can use on the, on the, the, in the cache partition. Um, and when the system runs out of space, out of storage space, it's going to start deleting some of your cache data. So if you stay below the quota that you're given, you can avoid your data being deleted. For this, you can use the storage manager. You can query the number of bytes that are uh, allocated to your app. You should query that from time to time, because the quota can change depending on how much of the quota you use or how often the user uses the application. Then when you want to allocate data, you can just use allocate bytes. You could do it yourself. You could just create a file. You could just create an output stream. But it's much better to do it this way, because when you go through allocate bytes, if needed, the system will delete another app's cache data to make space for your data. So that means that get cache quota bytes might be bigger than the free space that's left on the device. You can also use something called set, set cache behavior tombstone. So this is very useful to to, for your app to be able to tell the difference between a, a file that was never cached and, an app, and a file that was cached but deleted. So when you set that behavior and the system deletes some of your files in your cache, it will truncate the file. So the file will still be there, but the size will be set to zero. That tells you that the cache was deleted by the system. Um, and finally, uh, the usable space and the allocatable space are different. There's a lot going on in Android security in this release, and we only have a little bit of time to talk about it. Um, I want to highlight uh, some of the privacy improvements that are new in Android O. Um, if you've been using Android ID, you need to know now that it is going to be different for every app, for every user on the device. So it can't be used to track users between apps on the same device anymore. Similarly, uh, if you've been reflecting into system properties to get net.hostname, it is empty now. And so if you're saying, well, I'll, I really need uh, advertising IDs to be able to you know, uh, send users the correct contextual advertisements, that is what the advertising ID API in Google Play Services is for. So go check it out uh, in Google Play. But you cannot use Android ID. ID Android ID, you can't trust it anymore, uh, in the same way you might have done. Um, I had a slide here about WebView, but then Roman took it. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention about safe browsing in WebView is because WebView is now pushed to the Play Store every six months, you will be able to opt into safe browsing features as far back as Lollipop, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, we also saw the unveiling during the keynote of uh, something we're calling Google Play Protect, which is actually a lot of technologies that we've had uh, in place before, but really haven't given the visibility that they truly deserve, because we are watching out for people all the time. So any device with Google Play has Protect uh, enabled. Um, every app that gets uploaded to Play is pre-screened and continuously re-screened for each uh, new version that's uploaded. Uh, and every time you install an app, where you have Play Protect set up, uh, that app is going to be screened as well, even if you got it from another store or from you know, uh, ADB install. Uh, and 
we're really excited about this. Um, there is so much more to talk about, uh, so much more to talk about in uh, Android security. They gave me a whole like slide deck of stuff, so I said, why don't you have your own talk? I actually didn't say that they had their own talk anyway. On Thursday at 2.30, you're going to go and find out what's new in Android security from soup to nuts, everything from kernel hardening uh, all the way to more stuff about WebView. Language and runtime. I think you already know what I'm going to say. So this morning, we announced official support for Kotlin. You saw Steph on stage, and I see her sitting right there in the hallway. So if you see her at I.O., go say thanks. So Steph and the whole team behind her like, did an amazing work over the past you know, however much time to bring you this. Uh, so go thank her. She'll pass your thanks along to the whole team. So it's available today in Android Studio 3.0. Uh, there's a lot of documentation already online. I could spend hours talking about Kotlin and why it's good for you, why it's good for us. Actually, should I hijack the talk? Actually, he, he really could. He does, in fact. <laughs> But unfortunately, we don't have that much time in this session. So instead, I invite you to come on Friday at 10.30 uh, here on this stage. There's going to be a talk called Ind Introduction to Kotlin from Andre Breslav, the, tech uh, the lead language designer at JetBrains, and Hadi, uh, VP of uh, Developer Advocacy at JetBrains. And then in the afternoon, and then in the afternoon, on stage four, we'll have Life is Great and Everything it Will Be OK, Kotlin is Here, by Christina Lee from Pinterest and Jack Wharton from Square. So, and this is important to us because uh, the reason why we brought you Kotlin is because you, the community, is using Kotlin. We listened. We heard you. We're bringing you what you wanted. So we wanted to have you, the community, on stage to talk about it better than we can. Uh, also, if you have questions, you can come to the Developer Sandbox at the Android Core Platform booth uh, today from 3 to 4.30, on Thursday from 2 to 4, and on Friday from noon to 2 p.m. Andre, uh, the, the language designer, will be there to answer all your questions. So please come. If you want to know anything about Kotlin, just go there and go ask your questions. Now, uh, like Steph mentioned, we're also doubling down on our other languages, so the Java programming language, and we also have C, C and C++. So for the Java programming language, we're adding new packages in Android O. We have java.time that finally makes manipulating time and dates uh, easy, and it makes sense. It makes a lot more sense than the older APIs. We're also, <laughs> yeah, it's about time. We're also bringing you java.nio.file. Uh, it improves on the uh, good old java.io.file uh, API. It lets you access the attributes of the file. Uh, it lets you uh, easily manipulate paths and read files. We'll, we'll look at an example. And finally, java.lang.invoke. Um, it's a slight variation on reflection. Um, this is a gross approximation, but it's really cool because it lets you transform and wrap uh, method handles uh, to in your application. So here's an example of the new files API. So you can use the path class uh, to get a path. And then you can just call files.lines. It will read the entire content of the file. You're going to get a stream. So in this example, I'm using lambdas and stream APIs to remove all the empty lines, all the lines that start with the pound sign, and then I collect everything back into a single string uh, at the end. So it's a lot easier than it was before. All right, some changes in runtime. We heard about some of these this morning, and there's more about it this week. New concurrent copying collector, making everything basically faster and better. Concurrent copying means no pause time except when there's a full GC. So it can do all the stuff that it needs to do in the background while you're doing other stuff. Uh, in particular, one of the really cool things that it can do is actually compact the heap in the foreground. So previously in Art, I believe in the previous release, it had the ability to compact the heap, which is really good. It can defragment it. It can make the heap smaller. It can make allocations and collections faster. But it could only do this when activities were in the background. So it would go into an idle state and then sort of do it when it was in that idle state. But it, when it was in the foreground, there was nothing that it could do about the expanding and fragmenting heap. Now it can collect in the foreground, defrag in the, in the foregrounds, and everything gets faster. There's also a new faster mechanism for allocations. Uh, so it can just do bump pointer allocations, which is way, way faster. Collections are faster, and all of this essentially results in less jank for you. So faster to allocate stuff, faster to collect stuff means that just dealing with garbage and memory in general is much faster using art in the O release. Uh, lots of various optimizations, loop unrolling, inlining. One of the things to, to note is that Dalvik was created with a constraint of memory, uh, memory tight 
constraints, right? Like everything was about saving memory with Dalvik, which means that it could only do so much optimization and sort of reach the end of its life as far as what they could do to optimize things. When Art came online, they basically put in a platform upon which we could build future optimization. So we're starting to reap those benefits now where with every release, including O and future releases, we're going to be able to do more and more. And there's a bunch of them in this release. And you should check out um, a session later in the week for more information on that. Also, there's Dex locality. This, in particular, improves launch time for activities because we can collect all the memory uh, in the same space, so it's easier and faster to access as your application is starting up. So there's a session on Friday morning, performs and memory uh, improvements, so check that out for more particulars there. So beyond the platform, we have support library. We have other mechanisms for delivering things that aren't just about the O release. We wanted to call out some of those. There's the V26 beta release that comes out with developer preview 2. Uh, the stuff that we already talked about in text, fonts and XML, downloadable fonts, as well as auto sizing text view, those are all in there. You can check those out. In addition, there's something that we call emoji compat. So one of the big issues that we have with emojis is that if your friends are sending you emojis that are from some future standard, then whatever we shipped on the release that you're running, it's not possible for you to see those emojis. And you're going to see tofus instead, which, given some of the emojis I've seen, may be more attractive but not very meaningful. So wouldn't it be nice if you could actually get uh, updated emojis on your device? So now we have two mechanisms that apps can use to get updated emojis. One is that apps can actually bundle with updated emojis so they can update the apps to the Play Store and then to their users so that the users get more, uh, more timely updates of these emojis. The other and probably better, certainly long-term solution, is to actually use a, a service that we can provide through downloadable fonts that we talked about earlier where they can automatically get um, updated fonts through downloadable fonts. Right? So they can, the app can build in the capability to use uh, the downloadable fonts capability to have updated emojis as we provide them into the service. Uh, so again, go to the What's New in Support Library talk uh, tomorrow morning to learn more about all of those. We also had uh, more stuff going on in animation besides the small stuff in animator set I talked about earlier. We have the ability to now have physics-based animation stuff. Um, so if we want to see that in animation form, the ability to have essentially animations driven through velocity. All of the animation capabilities that we have in the platform to date have been driven around the idea of a duration. You tell it how, want you, how long you want it to run for. But many animations, you really want to drive it by the velocity, in particular animations that are driven by user interactions. You're dragging something on the screen and you let go. Wouldn't it be nice if it took off from your finger at the same velocity that you were dragging it when, it, when you let go? Uh, so flings, scrolls, all that stuff, uh, it really require a velocity-based animation system instead. You can do that with the animators, but it's really tedious. It requires math. Math is hard. And so we, we've baked in that capability to this new physics animation system uh, that is more natural, more interactive, and more interruptible because it was really intended to work with that um, user interactivity model. Uh, here's a small demo of this. So as we're dragging the top thing around, the other two circles are essentially hinged to the top one through springs that you defined. And so they follow it in space. They don't, they're not lockstep following it, but they're basically on springs that are attached. Uh, and they immediately benefit from that interactivity and that physics-based uh, notion of these springs. So there's a talk on this on Friday afternoon uh, all about the new physics-based animation stuff. Please come to that if you want to know more about that. Architecture components, this was mentioned in the keynotes. Um, we thought that maybe sometimes Android development is a little bit harder than it needs to be. So we um, took a step back and said, OK, what are some of the major problems that we should take another run at to try to simplify this for app developers? And a couple of those that we've taken specific runs at right now are around life cycle. Uh, it is apparently kind of hard to deal with the fact that your activities can die at any time when you rotate the screen or it goes in the background or whatever, and finding out exactly what state you're in can be a bit tedious. It is an ongoing issue that all app developers need to deal with. So we've taken another approach to that to make that much easier. And in addition to that, we've also taken a look at persistence. So you can issue raw SQL now. And that's about all you got on the system. Um, so we have a new way of doing that that builds on that capability and makes it easier and more powerful. And we're going to talk about all of those this week. We're going to have an introduction to architecture components I would encourage you to go to this afternoon. 
Uh, that's actually immediately after this session. And then tomorrow morning, we're going to have one on the life cycle problem and how we've solved that. And we're also going to have one on persistence and offline. And all of these are bits that you can actually try out in an early release form already. Um, so check those out. Hopefully, it'll make your developer lives easier. There are some behavior changes, some of which you're going to care about more than others. Uh, there have been some changes to the behavior of background applications, in particular location. If you are running as a background application, uh, you're only going to get coarse grains, uh, location information. And all of these things are being done not to make it harder, but to make the devices better. Right? If all applications have all capabilities at all times, and they can do whatever they need to or want to at any time, then essentially you're going to run the battery down because everybody's doing doing too much work all the time. So we're trying to be judicious about which applications actually need the services at which times so that we can make the experience for the user much better, the experience for your users much better as well. So one of those is in location, coarse grain information when you're in the background. Another one is wake locks. We noticed that it was common for an application to go into a background state and then into a cache state, and it would have a wake lock at the time, and it would just keep that wake lock, and it would hold it for a very long time, and that really runs the battery down. So now, sometime after you go into a cache state, the white clock is automatically released so that it doesn't put the device into that um, unseemly state. Uh, and also, there are uh, limits to execution when you're running in the background. There have also been changes to alert windows. In particular, there's this new type of window called Type Application Overlay. If you are targeting the OSDK, then this is the window type that you must use if you want to have an alert window capability. If you're on earlier releases, obviously that didn't exist. You're not going to use this. Just know that whatever window type you are using is going to be layered under one of these type application overlay windows uh, because we have a more clearly defined um, layering policy now with that. There is more information about this this afternoon at, wet, at 5 o'clock, background check and other insights. Um, so please come to that if you want to know all the details about that. Uh, and then finally, we promised to get back to this, didn't we? We did. This is our one more thing, right? All right. So we were going to talk about this. And I think, I mean, we have to, we have, to have a drum roll, don't we? Uh, how about a, like a thigh roll? Do we have a thigh roll? All right. That sounds nice. Unfortunately, I'm looking at the timer on stage, and I'm going to say that O stands for, <laughs> oh, no, we're out of time. Thank you. Welcome everyone. We have with us Soham Mondal today, who is a Google developer expert for user experience. Soham, what is UX according to you? So UX is, as you know, right, user experience. It's about understanding the need, uh, the basic goal that they want to achieve, and helping them achieve that goal, as simple as that. Recently, our app got featured on the Play Store. So what are your tips for other app developers? So the first thing is uh, do a lot of user research. Understand their backgrounds, their motivations, why they are installing your app in the first place. And then build something for that. Uh, after that, once you've understood that, you've tested that, done some usability testing, then follow guidelines, right? Guidelines make your life easier. Um, follow material design guidelines and other guidelines. That's how my app got featured in the Play Store. What are the tips you would like to give for people who are building for rural India? The challenges in rural India are completely different. Uh, you have to first of all localize the application, right? Uh, there are so many languages in India. It's very important that you localize the app and make it very, very accessible. Uh, apart from that, make sure that the gestures and icons and the overall application is very, very 
are localized. So people are not used to swiping because that's their first computing device. So make sure that you are uh, building something that they understand. And finally, make sure that you're doing usability testing, that they're able to achieve the task, right, in any kind of application. That's very, very important. So with all of this, I'm sure you'll be able to make a great application for, for the whole of India. You are a BLR Droid community organizer. What is it that motivates you to give your skills and expertise back to the community? I've been part of this community for, uh, you know, since 2009. And, um, you know, initially I was just a member. I used to go to meetups, I used to learn so much, I used to meet so many interesting people. It's such a great experience that you learn something, you meet people, and then you want to kind of give back to it because um, it's so good. I've learned so much from it. It's only fair that I give it back. So that's, that's my motivation. We have with us Aparna Sridhar, who is a product manager at Hacker Rank. There are so many people who really look up to you. What really inspired you into technology? I started like writing my first program when I was say, in sixth standard. You know, just playing around with basic back in the days when you know we had dial-up connection and when I decided what to do for uh, you know undergraduate studies. That's when um, you know I had the option to again pick. Um, computer science and at that point in time I dated back to this enjoyable experience I had as a child and thought maybe I would give that a try. Tell us about your experience as lead coach for the Udacity uh, Android Nano degree. Something that I would like to highlight about teaching is that it's been like the most uh, fulfilling and gratifying you know experience. Can I help that one student who almost wants to give up on programming who almost feels like this experience is too hard if I can help that one person at a time uh, you know progress I feel like later in their life, sometimes they would they would look back to do it for somebody else again. What is your message to the women in tech out there? Mm -hmm. We undergo a lot of stereotypes. I cannot tell you the number of times I'm the only woman in the room and automatically the question is, are you in sales, are you in marketing? The more women can do to like break that stereotype, to like embrace more of these roles, um, you know, the more we can change this perspective that we do have in tech. Thank you so much, Aparna. Welcome. This is our first certification summit. You guys and ladies are among the first certified Android developers. The developer base growing very fast, going and becoming the largest developer base in the world. The interesting point is that India is a mobile first market, however the percentage of developers developing for mobile is relatively low. So we're trying to really supercharge that. India is one of the emerging markets. 80% of the smartphone growth rate is expected till 2019. You guys are Android certified developers. And, and just, just imagine that you are going to reach these many people with your applications that you're going to develop. They're not trying to solve for the entire world. They're trying to solve for their own users. You are, at the end of the day, developing a product not for yourself, you're developing for end consumer. So I'm going to talk to you guys about what's new with Android O. Any of you guys use some of the Firebase 2.0 features? Yes, it's about recognition, it's about getting a job, it's about growing your career, but there are bigger forces at play. I feel that development, mobile development, Android, can make a difference actually in the world, fixing problems in one's own community, whether it's uh, uh, water, education, environment. But we want to support you connecting to communities and create change in the world. Firebase makes authentication easy for end users and developers. Most applications need to know the identity of a user so they can provide a customized experience and keep their data secure. Firebase supports lots of different ways for your users to authenticate. If your users want to authenticate with their email address, you can build that for them. Firebase Auth has built-in functionality for third-party providers such as Facebook, Twitter, GitHub and Google. It can also integrate with your existing account system if you have one. You're given the choice about how to present login to the user. You can build your own interface, or you can take advantage of our open source UI, which is fully customizable and incorporates years of Google's experience in building simple sign-in UX. No matter which one you use, once a user authenticates, three things happen. Information about the user is returned to the device via callbacks. This allows you to personalize your app's user experience for that specific user. The user information contains a unique ID which is guaranteed to be distinct across all providers, never changing for a specific authenticated user. 
This unique ID is used to identify your user and what parts of your backend system they're authorized to access. Firebase will also manage your user's session so that users will remain logged in after the browser or application restarts. And of course, it works on Android, iOS, and the web. That's Firebase Auth, allowing you to focus on your users and not the sign-in infrastructure to support them. Did you know that the average user has 36 apps on their device and doesn't use three quarters of them most of the time? And of those, about one third of them have only ever been used once. Well, what if that's your app? You've done the research, you've written the code, you've performed the testing, you've perfected the design, you've gotten the installs, and then nothing. So how do you prevent this? App indexing helps you re-engage with your users through tight integration with Google Search. As well as appearing in search results, it surfaces your app through autocomplete and now on tap. All you have to do is get your app in the index. And when users search for the content that's already in your app, they'll be able to see your app directly in the search results and be able to launch it right from there. It's as easy as that. But how does it work? If your app and site have similar content, you associate them with each other. Then your app can receive incoming links from search. On Android, these are achieved using standard Android app links and on iOS, using standard iOS Universal links. When a user searches for your content, they can then find your app. If you have the app installed, it will allow you to link directly to it. When the app launches, it sees the address of the index content and decides which screen to load to show it. It's really as easy as that. You can also use the app indexing SDK to submit content to the search engine based on how people use your app content. When people use your app, your search position can be improved. With app indexing, you get into the index, putting your app into Google search, and allowing you to re-engage your users. So you've built an amazing mobile app that your users are gonna love, but you wanna get it into people's hands and let them see just how awesome it is. Well, AdWords helps you do this, putting ads for your app in front of billions of people that use Search, YouTube, Google Play, and more. You can quickly set up an ad campaign to reach the type of users that might be interested in your app. You only pay if the user clicks on that ad, and you can set the budget and acquisition costs that you're comfortable with. But how do you know you're reaching the right users? Maybe some will install your app and forget about it, while others will make it part of their daily lives. Firebase Analytics helps you do this, you can define events that happen in your app that you consider to be important, such as reaching the first level of your game, purchasing a fancy new pair of sunglasses, or returning every morning to check out new products. You can tell AdWords which of these events are most important to you. Then, AdWords will display ads to people who are more likely to complete these important actions in the future. You can also build audiences, which are specific segments of users, and have AdWords display your app to them. For example, imagine that you have a group of users who are very active, have added a product to their cart, but haven't purchased yet. Well, you can use Firebase to create an audience of just these people and then use AdWords to give them specific ads and encourage them to come back to your app and take action. Understanding your users and engaging with them at just the right time and in the right way will help you build loyal users for your app. Firebase and AdWords, working together to help you grow your user base. Get started today, your new users are waiting. Android Instant Apps make it possible for users to access your app without having to install it first. Imagine users opening your app just by clicking on a link in an email or a text message. We've recently made Android Instant Apps available to all Android developers. To take full advantage of this, we have some best practices to help you make your Instant Apps user experience as great as that in your installed app, or maybe even better. You can find all this and more at the URL in the description below. It's important to keep in mind that by enabling your app to run instantly without installation, you're not creating another additional app. We're thinking of instant apps as another way to use the app your users already know and love. It's the same app, just without installation. By adding the ability to access your app directly from a link, a search result, or another app, it's much easier for users to engage with your app and get excited about it. If they decide to keep your app on their device permanently, they can then install it right from within the Instant App. 
The ability to launch an app without having to install it provides an enormous opportunity. For a long time, app developers have focused on the number of app installations as a proxy for the metrics their business really cares about. Without installation, users simply weren't able to engage with the developer's offerings at all. Removing this barrier to entry enables you to think about the metrics your business really cares about. Your audience is now just one tap away from engaging with your service. Your instant app is just another mode your app can run in. So don't branch your UI and make any unnecessary, cha unnecessary changes regarding the layout, interface, design, or experience of your instant app. The transition from instant to installed mode after installation should be as smooth and seamless as possible. Your users should have a rich and full app experience, even if they haven't installed your app. Rather than thinking of instant apps as a limiting factor to what your audience can do, think of it as an opportunity to get them to your functionality quicker and a way to foster your relationship with them. Avoid prompting your users to install the app when they're in the middle of a task. They'll be much more inclined to place your app onto their device permanently after it has had the opportunity to prove its usefulness. Refrain from bouncing them back and forth between your instant app and your mobile web offerings. You can probably tell by now, instant apps are all about removing friction for your users and getting them closer to your functionality. Think about ways you can remove further barriers for your users. For example, wait until users can see the benefit of making an account and signing in until the value of doing so becomes apparent. Asking users to create an account after installation seems like a small additional ask when they've already gone through the app installation flow and are only just getting started. However, when they're coming from a link looking for specific content or functionality, being asked to register can feel very disruptive. Additionally, make sure to use available APIs to make your and your user's life easier. Using Google Smart Lock, for example, makes signing up and signing in a much simpler and straightforward experience. In summary, we really think that instant apps will unlock a lot of opportunity to engage your audience more directly. Users will be able to focus on what it is they want to accomplish rather than having to spend time maintaining and updating apps on their phone. We're super excited to see what you come up with. Everything I talked about here and much more you can find on g.co slash instant apps. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Sridhar. Thank you for joining me here today. It's really great to have I.O. right in our backyard at Shoreline again. It's a real highlight for me. I get to meet other engineers, developers, and product leaders from around the world and check out all the amazing things that you're building. I've had a chance to talk to some of you, and I'm in awe of all the creativity that I've seen. You represent the best developers that are out there. I'm sure that the creators of the next Pokemon Go, Flipkart, or Airbnb are right here in this audience. But creating a successful business takes more than just an awesome product. All of you know that. 
I know of many great products that like, aren't really around because they're not able to get enough users or make enough money. So for my team here at Google, our mission is crystal clear. What can we do to help you turn your amazing products into profitable businesses? Today, we're going to discuss three things you need to focus on to get there. Number one is developing seamless payment experiences. Number two, earning more from your apps. And number three, growing by finding more of your best customers. We'll share new product innovations in each of these areas to help you delight your customers and make your businesses more successful. You've all heard the saying, the customer is always right. They are. Consumer expectations are higher than ever before. Consumers are looking for more useful and more delightful experiences every single day. And with billions of mobile users globally, the opportunity in front of us is pretty amazing. But the same is true for all of your competition, too. And people have way more choice now than ever before. Over 5 million apps, many, many more sites than that, hundreds of TV channels, social media. It goes on and on. So how are you going to stand out in this sea of amazing choices? Jim Liskey, the CMO of CarMax, recently put it this way. Consumers used to evaluate their experiences in silos. I'll compare CarMax against all other used car dealers. And I'll compare Nordstrom against all other clothing retailers. Let's go back one slide, please. Um, one slide forward. But now, people are clearly taking those best experiences from one industry and demanding that they receive the same or better everywhere. If they can order a very specific cup of coffee and get it every morning, why can't they have an experience that's bespoke and customized for them when they buy a car. That makes sense. With so much competition and increasing customer expectations, you can't win customers with a one-size-fits-all approach. This really calls for new strategies that puts the focus on each individual customer. It means understanding your customers and how they differ. It means creating growth and monetization strategies that reflect those insights. And it means using tools that are powerful and flexible enough to act on that information. And this is where we think we can help. Only Google can provide you with the tools and technology that help you put your customers at the center of how you develop, learn, and grow from your product. To start with, we're helping you develop easier ways to pay for your products and services. How many of you have abandoned a shopping cart online? I did, just yesterday. Sometimes it takes really long to check out, or you don't have your credit card handy. Either way, it's a pretty frustrating experience, both for you. You didn't get what you want done, and for the business that lost your money. Paying online should be easy. And that's one of the reasons why we've made this a top priority for Google. Our open platform approach maximizes the way in which people can pay. And the ways you can get paid, we want to provide a seamless, consistent experience across devices and across platforms. Hundreds of millions of people have already saved their preferred payment method, like a credit card or a debit card, to their Google account. And today, we're going to announce a developer solution that will allow people to use these safeguards when checking out in your apps, sites, and more, with just one single button. Payments are a critical part of the conversion process, and we want to help you make it as quick and as easy as possible. And when, when you make it easier for people to pay for what they want, you win. It's really that simple. Next up, earning more from your apps. While some of your users might make in-app purchases, let's face it, the majority never really do. 
And that's why earning money with in-app ads is the most common revenue model for mobile businesses. AdMob helps you do that. Today, over a million apps use AdMob to make money on iOS and on Android. In fact, to date, we've paid out over three and a half billion dollars in ads revenue to AdMob developers, like you, more than any other ad network. And a truly customer-centric monetization strategy means you monetize different user groups in different ways. For that, you need a solution that's powered by insights, one that offers great ad formats, easy-to-use tools, and helps you scale to meet increasing global demand. And today, we're going to show you a completely reimagined ad mob, rebuilt from the ground up based on your feedback to give you all of that and more for your apps. And last but not least, growing your user base. Finding valuable users isn't easy. Let me explain. I still love playing words with friends. I know. And part of what I love about the app is that my wife and I play against each other practically every day. We usually have multiple games going on on any given moment. And after playing a turn in one game, you have to view an ad before being able to play a turn in another game. My wife is blessed with a lot of patience. We'll wait between each game. On the other hand, I paid for the premium version of the game that lets me switch between unlimited games. My wife and I are two users who interact with apps in very different ways, both valuable but quite different. And as a developer, you need to value us differently. To that end, you need a marketing tool that knows and can help you pay the right amount when acquiring new customers who are like me or like my wife. That's why we introduced Universal App Campaigns. We call it UAC for short. UAC makes it easy to find users that not only install your app, but actually take actions within the app. UAC reaches users across iOS and Android on each of Google's billion user properties, like Google Play, Google Search, YouTube, Gmail, as well as the millions of sites and apps that are on our display network. And rather than having to manage multiple campaigns and manually optimizing each one across these channels and contexts, UAC does this automatically with one single campaign. It uses machine learning and AI to improve and make your campaign smarter with every single ad. And it learns from countless signals, like where people are engaging most with your app and which creative works best, all in real time. And with over half a dozen billion user properties, we have the power to find your users with both simplicity and massive scale. And it's working. At I.O. last year, we announced that our app ads had delivered over 2 million app installs. This year, I'm pretty excited to share that this has grown by a factor of 2.5 to over 5 plus billion app installs. Better yet, we are now helping advertisers drive over 3 billion in-app actions per quarter. These are real people taking real actions inside your app. Universal campaigns are transforming the way developers and marketers reach and acquire the right users. And we truly think this is the future of app growth. And to deliver more value to developers and marketers, we are bundling all future app growth innovations right into UAC, making it a one-stop shop to get stuff done. I'm an engineer. I'm really proud of these new innovations. And I'm excited about how they can help you understand and better serve your customers in order to stand out in what's a really competitive ecosystem. So with that, I'd like to bring up my team to dive deeper into these innovations. And we're going to kick it off with Pali Butt. Thank you. Thanks, Sridhar. Hello, everyone. I'm Pali, and I'm the product lead for payments at Google. And today, I want to share how you can make it easy for your customers to pay for your products and services while giving them a delightful experience. Now, your customers expect to engage with you wherever they are, whether it's on your mobile website or on your app or 
in the future through the assistant. Now, across all these surfaces, they expect checkout to be fast and easy. Unfortunately, the checkout screen is the single biggest source of friction in the purchase experience today. In fact, the problem is even more acute on mobile, where conversions are a full one-third lower relative to desktop. And a large reason for that is because the existing desktop checkout experience, which has been optimized over a period of 20 years, simply doesn't work well on mobile. Now, last year, we announced our first set of solutions to this complex issue, with Android Pay serving as your passport for giving your customers a streamlined checkout experience. We've seen tremendous progress over the last 10 months, with Android Pay now being available in 10 markets around the world. I'm excited to announce that we are going to be bringing Android Pay to even more markets over the next few months, including Brazil, Canada, Russia, Spain, and Taiwan. <laughs> We've also seen tremendous momentum on the app side, with thousands of top developers having adopted Android Pay to deliver a seamless checkout experience for their users. But we have the opportunity to bring this experience to even more users. And we can do that in partnership with all of you and the payments ecosystem. So I'm excited to share one of the first collaborations that is going to deliver a very, very meaningful number of users a much, much better checkout experience. And we've done this in collaboration with our friends at PayPal where PayPal users are going to get the streamlined Android Pay experience simply by linking the PayPal account to Android Pay. So very excited about this. So let me show you how this is going to work on the mobile web. So as I was thinking through what I'm going to show you all in terms of like buying something using PayPal and Android Pay in action, I thought of my eight-year-old. Earlier this week, he had a dress your color day at school. And dress your color basically means you have to pick your favorite color and wear your entire outfit in that color. His favorite color is blue. So he had on blue jeans, he had a blue top, he had a blue hoodie, and of course, because that wasn't blue enough, he even had a homemade blue cape. <laughs> the only thing that was missing was blue shoes. So I figured I'd surprise him and buy him some blue shoes today on Nike.com. Let me show you how this works. Let me switch to uh, the phone, please, for PayPal. Wonderful. So I'm going to bring up Nike.com on the Chrome browser. And I've already picked out the shoes. Okay, Got some sweet blue shoes. And when I'm ready to check out, I'm going to check out with PayPal as usual. And you'll notice that that gets Android Pay going. And instead of having to enter my username or password, all I need to do is use my fingerprint, authorize, and I'm done. Right? No more entering usernames or passwords or even having to create an account, you simply have to use your fingerprint. Now, this experience is going to be coming to many of the PayPal's millions of sites over the coming few months, and eventually roll out to all of their sites that have implemented PayPal. Now, let's switch back to the screen. Slides, please. Can you switch back to the slides, please? Hmm. Awesome. We want to bring the same experience to Visa Checkout and MasterPass users. 
It's very excited about that. And as excited as we are with all of the progress we've seen in Android Pay, we know that our over 1 billion plus Google users don't all have Android Pay, or for that matter, any digital wallet. However, these Google users frequent popular Google products like Google Play and YouTube, and as Sridhar mentioned, have saved hundreds of millions of credit and debit cards to their Google accounts. So today, we want to announce a simple API for all of you developers out there to be able to accept all of these payment methods through Google. And developers who adopt this API can enable an easy to use checkout experience for their customers. And of course, as we discussed earlier, reduce the amount of friction which can lead to higher conversions and more revenues. Best of all, this new developer API, which we call the Google Payment API, is going to be free for developers. Okay. Now, users don't need to do any additional setup. If they've already saved their payment method to Google, they simply sign in and get this streamlined checkout experience. Now, we've built this Google Payment API on top of the payment request standard, which is now a W3C spec. Now, developers can simply add this Pay with Google button to their favorite websites or apps by integrating with the Google Payment API. I want to share with you a little story about this uh, Pay with Google button that you see here. This button is very similar to the sign in with Google button that users are already used to. And our team was brainstorming all of the different variations that we could possibly have on this button. And one of my absolute favorite variants was treat yourself with Google. Now, we didn't land on that, but I think we've got a really good alternative with Pay with Google. So speaking of treating myself, I wanted to buy some cool new headphones, and Wish is exactly the place to get it. So we've been doing some work with our friends over at Wish to enable this cool Pay with Google experience. Let me show you how it works within the app. Can we switch to the Wish phone, please? Thank you. So let me bring up the Wish app. I've already added the cool black headphones that I wanted to my cart. And whenever I'm ready to pay, I simply need to pick my form of payment. And here's the special part, right? I've got all of my payment methods already attached to my Google account. You see that PayPal account that I just used to buy those cool blue shoes? I have that. I have the MasterCard that I've added to Android Pay. And of course, I have my American Express that I've saved to my Google account. So I'm going to continue. And that's it. I slide to pay. right? I don't need to. Enter any usernames, remember passwords, or have to create a new account on the Wish site. Pay with Google makes it that simple. Now, the Wish team is going to be rolling out this Pay with Google experience to all of their users in the coming weeks. But we've also been working with a lot of the top developers to enable this Pay with, user, pay with Google experience to more users. So let's switch to the Slides, please. So I'm excited to announce that we are soon going to have Airbnb, Deliveroo, DoorDash, and E24 integrated with the Pay with Google experience. And many more developers are going to be coming soon. So as you saw, this experience is something that's going to be available not just in the United States, but also internationally. So we're very excited about that. 
And if you're interested in this API, you can sign up for early access. So that was Pay with Google in action across both the mobile web and within apps. But we also talked about how the Assistant is going to be a huge new platform for commerce. So one of the things we've done is work closely with the Assistant team to bring the same great Pay with Google experience to the Google Assistant. Now, if you were at the keynote, I think you might have seen a demo already of how this ordering experience would look on Panera. Now, let's see that demo in action again. So let's switch to the demo that we have for the assistant. And now I'm going to be trying this on the assistant. It's a little bit noisy in here. So if everyone can bear with me and keep real quiet, we're going to do this live. Okay. So I'm going to bring up the assistant and then try to order a sandwich and some smoothies from Panera. Uh -huh. <laughs> These came back from a search. Talk to Panera. I found a couple of places. Uh, I think it's a bit noisy, so I'm going to try again. Talk to Panera. I found a couple of places. Mm. <laughs> Feels like we have a lot of noise in here. Maybe we can all do it together. Let me try once more, because this demo is really cool. Talk to Panera. I found a couple of places. Ah. The demo gods are not smiling on us. So you know, we're going to give it one more shot, because all of you, I think, would be interested in this. And then we'll switch to a cool video we have in case this exactly happened. Talk to Panera. Ah. I found a couple of places. <laughs> so you know what? Why don't we actually switch to the video? And I'll show you a little bit of how this works on the video. So the cool thing about this is if you're actually in a less noisy environment than the Shoreline Amphitheater, which hopefully not many of you are trying to use the Assistant in, then you can actually get this experience where you can interact with the Assistant across both voice or by interacting with your touch screen. And the cool thing about it is you can switch seamlessly between both the voice and using the prompts that the assistant gives you. So in this particular example, I could actually start ordering, let's say, the strawberry poppy seed salad without chicken, and then switch to picking out my favorite smoothie, and then checking out. And what we've done is integrated the Pay with Google experience into the assistant. So developers like you can have a seamless experience for all of your customers. And of course, just like you saw with both that uh, PayPal purchase I showed you and the Wish purchase I showed you, you simply confirm with a fingerprint and you're done. So we're very excited about all of these new experiences that we are bringing, bringing to developers like you so we look forward to seeing all of you integrating Pay with Google into your websites, apps, or experiencing it through the Assistant. With that, I'd like to welcome Sissy Shao, who's going to tell you a little bit more about how you can monetize and grow your apps. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Sissy, and I am super excited to be here today to share with you how Google will help you build a more successful mobile apps business. As Sridhar talked about earlier, there are over 5 million apps across Android and iOS. And if I tell you that the vast majority are free, I'm sure most of you won't be surprised. So what does it mean for you trying to build a great business that users want both free and amazing apps. It means that you need to think very creatively about how to monetize your apps 
and make sure that you're using everything in your arsenal, including in-app purchases, subscriptions, and now increasingly, advertising. Those of you who are using AdMob know that putting in-app ads is a primary and effective way to monetize your apps. And we at Google have been focused on connecting you to millions of Google advertisers and over 40 ad networks. But just putting ads into your apps isn't enough. How do you build a product that delights your users with ads experiences that are just as good? In order to be successful, you need to be as thoughtful about putting ads into your app as the core user experience itself. Let's take a major game developer, Zepto Lab. I think they made Cut the Rope, which I'm sure most of you have played at one time. And they have a new awesome game called Cats. They have been using the AdMod platform for over five years to monetize their apps. And they use our full suite of formats, including interstitials, rewarded video ads, and now native advanced. And when they're doing that advertising, they're very, very careful to make sure that the ads are native to the game and that they're blending seamlessly so that users who are playing are still having a delightful and fun experience. And it's working for them. Since they've added rewarded ad units to CATS, they have more than tripled their ad mob revenue in the past few months. Zepto Labs is just one example. There are now over 1 million apps using AdMob across Android and iOS to monetize their apps. And we have paid out more than $3.5 billion to date to app developers, more than any ad network. But we know you need more. We've been listening to your feedback very closely, and we've heard that you need more from this product. You need three things. Number one, you want a holistic picture of your revenue, not just ads, but how does ads relate to the other revenue streams like in-app purchases and subscriptions. Number two, you want integrated app analytics. You want to see how ads work and how they affect the core user experience of your app itself. And finally, number three, you want better and more powerful tools to manage and ma maximize your revenue. Because of these needs, that's what spurred my engineering team to embark on a mission and rebuild AdMob from the ground up. And that's why today I am incredibly excited to sh share with you the launch of a completely rebuilt, reimagined AdMob. Thank you. We wanted to give you the tools you need to build a successful mobile apps business. And we're focused on building an end-to-end -end monetization platform that works for you. Our goals here are primarily twofold. Number one, we want to give you deeper insights into how your ads behave and how they affect the rest of your core app. And I'll show you that in a second. And number two, we built advanced controls so that you can, and reporting so that you can maximize and optimize your ads revenue. And finally, we built all of these features on a clean and modern, redone user interface. However, instead of just talking about it, let me show you a few screens from the real, really new ad mob. Let me story tell for a second. Suppose that I am a developer at a mid-sized company building health and fitness apps. And when I first log into the new ad mob, I see a completely different user experience. And what I see here is a home dashboard. This home dashboard is a quick snapshot of all the apps in my AdMob account. And it's telling me important information about how much I'm making in each of these apps across my entire business. If you see at the top, I'm showing a new scorecard, which is telling me how much I've made today, this week, uh, yesterday, this week, and this month. So it seems to be a really useful way for me to check how my business is doing. If I scroll down, I'm going to see a new card on the left called the App Performance Card. And here, we're breaking out each of the apps in this account and telling me how much money I'm making across my business. If I look carefully, though, it looks like FitMobber, which is my best app, has been tanking. It's dropped over $200 yesterday, which is a disaster, because this is the one that's growing the best. I need to figure out exactly what's going on. 
I dig in, I drill in and click on that. And let me jump out of story mode for a sec to explain to you what you're seeing now. You're now seeing a completely new app overview dashboard. And this app overview dashboard is a dashboard designed to show you exactly what's going on within a particular app. In this case, in our demo, this is the FitMobber app. And you can see on both the left hand and the top that it's showing you that all the numbers you're seeing are related to FitMobber. And furthermore, in the middle, I see two new reports on the left with the colored bars, a total revenue report. And this is showing me not just ads revenue from AdMob. It's also layering in in-app purchases, subscriptions, or other in-app monetization models right into that bar chart. So you can see at a glance how my overall revenue is trending across all of these different revenue streams. On the right, I see also a completely new user metrics card. And this card is showing me important health metrics of my core app, including sessions and retention. What we've done to enable this is weave together Google Analytics for Firebase directly into the core of AdMob. We know that ads are a critical part of your user's experience. You cannot build an amazing app without understanding how ads behave in the app. And you can't monetize well without understanding how users behave in your app. So for the first time ever, AdMob and Firebase can share data across these two platforms to help you gain deeper insights and build a more successful mobile apps business. Cool. Let me get back to my story and tell you how I can use this to fix my FitMobber issue. So if I look at these numbers on the left, it looks like the blue bars have been shrinking. And the blue bars are actually my ads revenue. So that makes sense. That's why I saw the $200 drop yesterday. And if I look on the right, user metrics have also taken a turn for the worse. In fact, sessions per user and session duration are both down. That means that users are using the app less and walking away more. I go to talk to my team and ask them what is going on. And I learned that they put a new ad unit right at the screen in the app that, that is right before users work out, which means that they were just deterred enough to stop working out and stop subscribing to my app. That was a really bad placement for that ad, for sure. I move it, and I wait a week. I hop back into the same screen in the new ad mob, and wow, everything is back and up and to the right. Business is now booming at FitMobber, and I, I'm a global company. I'm also using an advanced feature called mediation. And mediation is very simple. It's basically a set of rules that allow me to send my ad units to different ad networks. And if you're a bigger app publisher business, this is really important for you to use and to maximize your revenue. Managing mediation in the new mob, ad mob is easier than ever with a feature called mediation groups. And what mediation groups lets you do is it lets you set up a single set of mediation rules and then apply it across apps, ad units, or geographies. I'll give you an example. Let's say that FitMobber is doing really well, especially in Japan. And in Japan especially, you want to send your ads to different regional ad networks, because there are a few ad networks there that want to buy ads just for users there. Using mediation groups, it's now very easy to do this. I set up one mediation group for Japan with, with my rules. And after that, it's quite trivial to add ad units. I can add ad units to this group, and it will start automatically obeying the rules. I can also, if I change my mind and want to reorder or add different ad new, new networks, add that in one place or change it in one place and have it automatically apply to all of my ads in my Japan app. Very simple and very powerful. At this point, I've talked to you a lot about how Google is helping you build a great in-app advertising business. I want to pivot, pivot completely and talk about another extremely crucial part of building a successful business, maybe the most crucial part, and that is growth. You cannot have a successful mobile apps business without having a successful growth strategy. And in order to do that, you have to answer two questions. Number one is, who are my best users? And number two is, where can I find them? 
where are the most effective channels that I can show them my app and get them to download and try it? I'm excited to share that Google has been working on these problems, and we have quite a few features to share uh, to solve these growth challenges. Let me start with Google Play. Android is, in, is now active with over 2 billion monthly active users every month. And Google Play is in over 190 countries around the world. People turn to Google Play every day to discover great apps and games to enjoy. And we find increasingly that besides searching in the Play Store, which they definitely still do, they search for the apps that they want, they are also responding and downloading apps that we're recommending to them as they're browsing the Play Store. Because of that, and to help you find those users who are browsing and discovering their next favorite app in the Play Store, we're announcing new ad placements in the home and app listings pages of the Google Play Store. These ad units will only be available exclusively to universal app campaigns. And they'll help you reach users right when that, they're in that mode of discovery in the Play Store. Obviously, besides the Play Store, there are many other channels that people are discovering their next favorite app. And that's why we built Universal App Campaigns, or UAC, as we like to call it. UAC helps you reach people across multiple billion user properties, including Google Play, Google Search, YouTube, Gmail, and millions of apps and websites across the Google Display Network. In order to use UAC, it's very easy. You tell us what app you want to promote. You tell us the price that you want to pay per install. And you give us a little bit of information to help us create ads, like text, images, videos. We then take all of that information in UAC, and we use machine learning to deliver the maximum number of installs to you at the price that you've specified. And we do this by automating and optimizing every single bit of the advertising itself, including what the ads look like, where to put the ads, and also, more importantly, where, what to bid for each impression and click so that we hit that target price that you want while delivering the maximum number of installs for you. So wherever your users are and whatever they're doing, whether they're searching on Google or watching videos on YouTube, only Google has the breadth of channels to help you find your most valuable users right when they want to download your app. Universal App Campaigns has been helping companies like Headspace, which is a very popular meditation app, improve health and happiness around the world. And according to Robert from Headspace, Universal App Campaigns has saved their team time and driven results. Translation, more users that use and love the app in less time. However, like Headspace, we all know that growth isn't just about installs. Many users will install your app and not go, down, go along and spend or engage or potentially even open it. You need to spend your acquisition dollars wisely to find your most valuable users, the ones that will engage and spend and activate and enjoy your apps. Because of that, I'm also extremely happy that we're announcing two new bidding options in Universal App Campaigns, target CPA, or cost per acquisition, and target ROAS, or return on ad spend. And these bidding strategies will help you profitably acquire high value users. Or put more simply, it helps you pay more for users who will pay you more and pay less for users who we think will pay you less. So I give you, I'll give you a very concrete example. Uh, my husband and I are both mobile gamers, and we both love this new game by Nintendo called Fire Emblem Heroes. I don't know if you've played it or not. Um, it's a tactical RPG, and basically in this game, you collect heroes, and the way that you collect heroes is through exchanging a virtual currency called orbs. Now, I'm sure most of you who've played games know that the way to get orbs is usually two ways. One is you buy them with real money, and number two is you can sort of grind it out in the game and earn them over the course of playing. Now, I am really very impatient and also very competitive, so I have no issues spending over $100 buying orbs to collect my favorite heroes. My husband, on the other hand, is you know, more principled and wants to grind it out, and he's just a little cheap. 
So he's willing to spend maybe at most $5. For an, an app developer like Nintendo, they should be thinking about acquiring players like me at a high price point, at a higher price point than players like my husband, who spend a lower price point. And with these new bidding strategies, they can do exactly that. And finally, at the core of any smart growth strategy is measuring whether you're spending your acquisition dollars wisely. And we know that many of you are using third-party measurement providers to measure the attribution of your installs. And that's why today, I'm happy to announce that Google is launching a completely new app attribution program. And what this program does is it's designed to integrate data from these seven global companies that you see on the slide right into AdWords. And our goal is to create consistency and reliability of the data integration and the results that you'll get. We have also streamlined the flow. So it's incredibly easy now to get these uh, app measurement companies up and running if you're using AdWords. With that, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to be here and share all of these great features that my team has been working on. Please try them out, and please share your feedback with us. And with that, I'd like to turn it back to Sridhar to close with his final thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Sissy. You know what's really exciting about presenting to all of you? We know that we have the most innovative thinkers in the app world right here. We know that many of the products that redefine how we communicate, shop, stay entertained, are going to be done by you. That's why we find it so exciting. Um, and we also know that in order to turn these products into successful businesses is more important than ever before for you to figure out how to simplify the payments process, how to tailor your ad experiences to generate the maximum amount of revenue, and to find the right users for your app. And those of you that, that do this are really the ones that are going to be successful. Um, we have a number of great follow-up sessions, including one on payments right after this. They're up here. Um, thank you all for listening to us. Take care. The Firebase Notifications Console lets you re-engage your users quickly and easily. With it, you can manage and send notifications to your users easily with no additional coding required. Messages can be addressed to single devices, Firebase Cloud Messaging topics, or devices that you select using powerful analytics tools. So, for example, you can send a message to all of your users who have made an in-app purchase, giving them a special offer 
allowing you to re-engage with them. The Firebase Notifications Console integrates with analytics so you can measure the effectiveness of your messages and explore insights based on your users' activities so you can grow your application by easily engaging your users through the Firebase Notifications Console. We all know from experience that people love to share things about themselves, such as photos, videos, and GIFs that express their feelings. So what do you do to let them store and share these files through your app? That's where Firebase Storage can help. Our storage API lets you upload your users' files to our cloud so they can be shared with anyone else. And if you have specific rules for sharing files with certain users, you can protect this content for users logged in with Firebase authentication. Security, of course, is our first concern. All transfers are performed over a secure connection. Also, all transfers with our API are robust and will automatically resume in case the connection is broken. This is essential for transferring large files over slow or unreliable mobile connections. And finally, our storage, backed by Google Cloud Storage, scales to petabytes. That's billions of photos to meet your app's needs, so you will never be out of space when you need it. So give your users space to share their lives with Firebase Storage, available right now for iOS, Android, and web applications. And to learn more about Firebase Storage, check out the documentation available right here. Analytics. We all know they're important to building a successful app, which is why there are many different kinds of analytics tools for app developers to use. There are in-app behavioral analytics, which measure who your users are, what they're doing, and so on. And then you've got attribution analytics, which you can use to measure the effectiveness of your advertising and other growth campaigns, not to mention push notification analytics and crash reporting. But quite often, this work is being done by completely different analytics libraries, which means you've got reports living in various tools across the web and trying to understand trends across these different reports, much less get them to talk to each other, isn't always easy. That's why we've created Firebase Analytics. Firebase Analytics is built from the ground up to provide all the data that mobile app developers need in one easy place. And it starts by giving you free and unlimited logging and reporting. That's right, no quotas, no sampling, and no paid tier to worry about. Simply by installing the Firebase SDK, Analytics automatically starts providing insight into your app. You receive demographic information on who your users are, how regularly they visit your app, how much time they've spent using it, and how much money they've spent in your app. But not all apps are alike, and you can get detailed information about what your users are up to by logging events specific to your app. These can include common events that Firebase Analytics has already defined, like when your users add an item to their cart, and there's also support for custom events you create yourself, like when a user completes a workout in your fitness app or when they take a selfie in your photo app. Geez. But it's not just about seeing what your users are doing. It's also about discovering who your users are. So in addition to demographic information, you can also discover how your different groups of users behave by setting custom user properties. Have a music app and want to find out whether your classical music fans are browsing more albums than your jazz fusion fans? That's the kind of data you can easily break out thanks to custom user properties. And Firebase Analytics doesn't just measure what's happening inside your app, it lets you combine your behavioral reporting, what your users are doing, with attribution reporting, or what growth campaigns are bringing people to your app in the first place. So if you want to know which ad campaigns are bringing you the users who spend the most money, or are sharing the app with their friends, or have unlocked the last level in your game and are ready for the sequel, you can do all of that in Firebase Analytics. But don't stop there. Once you have all this information, you can take action on it using Firebase Analytics audiences. Firebase Analytics gives you the power to build up groups of users, or audiences, out of just about anything you can measure in your app. Want to target users in Brazil who have visited the sports section of your in-app store? It's as easy as a few clicks in the Firebase console. Once your app has built up this audience, you can send them notifications using Firebase notifications, or you can modify their in-app experience using Firebase Remote Config, or you can target them through AdWords, Google's ad platform. And then, because that impact can be measured using Firebase Analytics, you can confirm you're getting the outcomes you expect. Firebase Analytics already comes with a dashboard that lets you view answers for common questions, 
But if you need more specialized analysis, you can export all of your data into BigQuery, Google's data warehouse in the cloud, where you can run super fast SQL queries to slice and dice this data however you'd like. You can even combine it with other analytics data that you might be capturing. And this is just the tip of the iceberg of what Firebase Analytics can do for you. To find out more, check out our documentation here and give Firebase Analytics a try. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2017 TensorFlow Developer Summit. And I'm delighted to see all of you here today. Today, we are excited to announce TensorFlow 1.0. TensorFlow's philosophy has always been to give you the power to do whatever you want, but also make it easy, and this makes it even easier. We really were hoping to build a machine learning platform for everyone in the world that was fast, flexible, and production ready. The point of TensorFlow is to figure out how can we give this back to the community and be able to use TensorFlow to further whether it's the research or the production needs. It's how we express our ideas and it's the piece of software our engineers and scientists spend most of their time interacting with. So TensorBoard is a really exciting tool. It's something that will let you take the confusing world of TensorFlow and start to dive into it. It's just a really amazing time to be an AI researcher. One of the projects that we've been working on is using deep learning for retinal imaging. Can we use deep learning and reinforcement learning to generate compelling media? But this is just the beginning. The TensorFlow community is truly global. We want to see all the amazing things that you guys can do with TensorFlow. Thank you very much. Good morning, Berlin. It is an absolute pleasure to be here with you. Here we go. We're live. We have a lot of experience building some of the world's most popular applications. And we've learned a thing or two about what it takes to build an app. And we found that it's a pretty difficult process. A lot of your time goes into running infrastructure instead of building the features that make your app your app. There has to be a better way. That better way is using Firebase. We're now up to over 750,000 developers using the product. If you use Firebase, your app's code talks directly to our powerful managed backend services. We take care of security and of scalability so that you can focus on building the features that your users love. Today we're launching Firebase UI 1.0. It's an open source library. It has customized theming and it works for web and Android and iOS. So you can go ahead and drop that in and you'll have all of the UIs that you'll need. Is my app set up correctly? Which events are being captured by the SDK? Are you receiving my events and parameters? We've built something, the ideal tool to answer all of these questions and these pain points. App quality leads to better user retention. The better your app is and the more stable it is, the more likely for users to come back and for your business to be successful and sustainable. And that's where we come in. So we're really looking forward to get the feedback from the community, as always, to help us continue to refine our product and to work together to help you build a better app. And we want you to be able to spend all of your energy on bringing innovation and creativity, something new to the world. That's really what we're trying to achieve here, is making all the infrastructure pieces simple for you. And I'm really excited for you to engage with Firebase and see how it can make you more successful. All right, let's get back to the code. Hey gang, want to see something neat? Check out this awesome hidden feature I found in Firebase Analytics. So I'm over here looking at all my reports in the Firebase Analytics dashboard. Uh, here, for instance, I've got my active users for the last 30 days, and while these graphs sure are pretty, I'm thinking it'd be kind of nice if I could get these numbers into like Google Sheets or maybe Excel so I could analyze them a little better, right? Well, watch this. I'm going to select my graph here in the Firebase console. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell, but you can see by like the highlighted text here that my graph has been selected. And then I'll hit Command-C to copy it. And then I'm going to switch to a blank Google spreadsheet and hit Command-V to paste. And uh, look at that. All my values are right there in the spreadsheet for me to analyze. So you can see here uh, on the leftmost column, I've got the date, and then all the actual numbers are in the columns next to it. 
Now you might notice that I seem to have two columns of what looks like the same data, right? I've got monthly active users here, and then right next to it, I've got this monthly users column. And then the same goes for my weekly actives and same for my daily actives. And so basically that first column is for the value that corresponds to the date here on the left. The second column is basically for that corresponding date in the previous 30-day time period. Uh, basically, it's the values that belong to this dotted line here in the graph that I copied. Make sense? Okay. And then I can do the same thing for a bunch of these other graphs. Uh, here I can copy and paste my daily engagement numbers. Let's uh, get these into a new sheet here. And uh, again, you can see I've got my engagement numbers uh, from this time frame in this first column, and then those same numbers uh, for the previous 30 days in this second column. And uh, better yet, I can jump over to an individual event, like this completed five levels event, and uh, copy all these graphs here at the top. And you can see I'll get event counts, user counts, event per user counts, and uh, values for every one of my events that I am recording in Firebase Analytics. And uh, this lets me do some pretty nice calculations right here in Google Sheets. Uh, for example, let's say our game designer is curious how often people are failing a level in our game. Well, for starters, I've got my level start graph here uh, to show when people are starting a level in my game. So first, I'm going to copy and paste these numbers into a new sheet. Let's uh, put them in. OK, great. And then I'm going to do the same thing for my level fail graph, um, and that will show when people have failed a level. So we'll copy from here, and we'll paste them right in next to uh, my other numbers. And once I've copied and pasted these values into Google Sheets, I can then calculate my average failure rate per game stat by dividing this number here by this other one. Uh, I'm going to copy this formula down for all of my dates. Let's uh, give it a percentage format so it looks nice. Uh, maybe we'll add an average at the bottom here. Let's do average for all these numbers. And uh, there we go. Looks like my game has an average failure rate somewhere in the low 30s, which sounds like it's just challenging enough for our players. So uh, our game designer is happy. Now, a couple of disclaimers here. Uh, first, this doesn't work on all the graphs I've tried. Some of them just don't seem to copy and paste as well as others. Uh, but it does work on a surprising number of them. You'll just kind of have to try them out and see if they work. And second, this will never be a replacement for some of the awesome and sophisticated data analysis capabilities you get by exporting your raw data to BigQuery. And you should totally go watch this video if you want to find out more. Uh, but if all you want to do is maybe compare two graphs to each other or calculate some standard deviations or averages on a particular event, this trick can work surprisingly well. So give it a try yourself, have fun with it, and we will see you soon on another episode of Firecasts. Hello, everyone. My name is Rahul. I'm the product lead on Chrome. And I'm excited to be back up here again this year to tell you about all the amazing progress we've made over the last 12 months. The theme of today, and something you're going to hear again and again, is that the modern mobile web is now mainstream. And this is really an amazing shift. So I'm going to tell you all about what's been happening and what it all means for you. It's the mobile web state of the union. So let's dive right in. The web has incredible reach. Just Chrome alone runs on over 2 billion devices, from phones 
to tablets, to PCs. And the web is much bigger than just Chrome. There are over 5 billion devices out there that can access web content. 5 billion, that is a large number. And this didn't happen because of luck. This wide reach is a direct consequence of how the web operates. It is an open, decentralized platform. It has no gatekeepers. Developers get wide reach. Users get low friction. And on the Chrome team, our mission has always been to move the web platform forward. We spend a lot of time working on making the web platform better, lots of things on the foundations, things that uh, just happen under the hood that you may not even recognize. But with every such change, the web platform just gets better. To take one example, over the last year, we focused our JavaScript performance on real-world web usage. It's sort of like, what kind of car would you rather drive? A car that's been road tested in real-world driving conditions, or a car that's been tested in an artificial lab setting? We want our car, and our JavaScript engine is literally called V8, we want our car to be great on the roads that people actually drive on. And currently, we think the speedometer benchmark best captures this real-world usage. So I'm pleased to announce that Chrome on Android is now 35% faster on the speedometer benchmark compared to a year ago. And we've seen similar gains. And we've seen similar gains on other OSs as well. To take another example, I'm sure all of us have experienced the annoyance of loading a web page and starting to read some content, only to have it jump to a different location. And this usually happens because some off-screen content is loaded in and pushed down the visible content. Now, to improve this user experience, we launched a new feature called scroll anchoring. And scroll anchoring works by locking the scroll position to an element that is visible on the page, so the user stays in the same position even as off-screen content gets loaded in. So to show you what this looks like in action, on the left is Chrome without scroll anchoring. And on the right is Chrome with scroll anchoring enabled. And this is a long page. And as we scroll out on the bottom of this page, you'll see on the right, the page stays locked in position, while on the left, the page is jumping all over the place as off-screen content gets loaded in. Now, this is a bit of a contrived demo just to show you exactly what's going on. But since we launched this feature, what we have seen is that on average, scroll anchoring prevents three jumps per page load. So this has had a huge impact on the quality of the user experience. And there are many more such changes, things that don't need any action from developers or users, but that just make the web platform better. So that's the foundation. Next come all of the features and APIs that enable you all to do great things, to build great experiences on top of that foundation. And today I'm going to talk about the amazing momentum we've seen across the core pillars of the modern mobile web. I'm going to talk about what we are doing to make web apps more polished and feel more integrated into the device. And I'm going to talk about all the ways we've do, we're working on to make building web apps easier than ever before. So let's start with momentum. One of the core pillars of the modern mobile web is accelerated mobile pages, or AMP, for content-focused experiences. Now, we all know that content experiences on the web can sometimes be quite painful. And we spearheaded the AMP project last year, the open source AMP project last year, to improve this experience. And the benefits that AMP brings are stark. On average, an AMP page loads in less than a second, and it uses 10 times less data. And as a result, the growth of AMP has been phenomenal. Last year at this time, there were 125 million AMP documents out there. And today, there are over 2 billion AMP pages from over 900,000 different domains.
amazing momentum. And more and more platforms are now linking out to AMPs. And they're doing this because they find that their users are more engaged when they can get to their content faster. For example, LinkedIn has found that people will spend 10% more time reading an article when it's an AMP page versus when it's not. And today, I'm excited to announce that several new partners are going to be supporting the AMP project in the coming weeks. Twitter will begin linking out to AMPs across all of their mobile web and native app properties. Tumblr will begin using AMP for 300 million of their blogs. Weibo will begin supporting AMP in the coming weeks, and Tencent's Qzone will also begin, out, begin linking out to AMP in the next few weeks as well. And finally, AMP is seeing success in new verticals like e-commerce. With components such as AMP Bind, merchants can build interactive and engaging user experiences, and many merchants are doing just that. So that's AMP, a great way to build content-focused experiences for the modern mobile web. The second pillar of the modern mobile web is progressive web apps, or PWAs. Progressive web apps are a way to build app-focused experiences that are reliable, fast, and engaging. And we were inspired to start this journey based on our belief that web experiences can and should be radically better. And users love these experiences, which means that they're more engaged, which means conversions are higher, which means business metrics are better. So this is just a good thing all around. But rather than me tell you about how awesome progressive web apps are, let's take a look at one that just launched recently. It is my pleasure to invite up on stage Patrick Trauber and Katie Sievert from Twitter. <laughs> Thank you, Raul. Hello, Google I.O. My name is Patrick Trauber, and I'm the product manager for Twitter Lite. And I'm Katie Sievert, engineer on the Twitter Lite team. Just five weeks ago, we launched Twitter Lite for the goal of delivering a great user experience at scale. Oops. Uh, sorry. Sorry, one second. We set out to build a Twitter client that, one, loads quickly on slow networks, two, uses less mobile data, and three, works on all smartphones. Each month, more than 300 million users come to Twitter to find out what's happening in the world. And over 80% of our users are on mobile devices. We were seeing healthy growth in mobile web usage at Twitter, so we wanted to make sure that this experience was top notch. But rather than just telling you about Twitter Lite, why don't we give you a live demo? Katie, can you walk us through Twitter Lite? Sure. Let's pull it up. When users visit Twitter Lite on Android, they're prompted to add it to their home screen. In fact, Twitter Lite receives a million visits each day via the home screen icon. Let's go ahead and launch it. As you can see, it initially launches us in full screen mode, just like a native app. And Twitter Lite is optimized for speed, taking advantage of the purple pattern to improve loading times by 30%. And with service worker caching, reloading the app is near instant and consumes no additional data. As you scroll through the timeline, it's fast and smooth like a native app. And since many users come to Twitter to get the latest news and often tap on publishing links, we've been big fans of AMP. On that note, let's go take a look at what Owen with the Google team is doing. He usually tweets interesting articles. Let's check out this one. We're, well, we're excited today to announce that Twitter Lite links, now links out to AMP pages so that content loads almost instantly and uses less mobile data. For, ex for example, you can see here that when Katie tapped the link to the Guardian post on Owen's profile page, it loaded instantly in a new tab. Now let's show off a couple of engagement features. One of the key pieces of a polished experience is making sure users can capture media and tweet it. So 
to make things a little more interesting slash exciting, what do you say about doing a live photo tweet from on stage? All right. It's like you knew I was already going to do it anyway. All right. With the disclaimer that I'm not a professional photographer, although you don't need to use Twitter. Everyone strike a pose. All right. Center that. So let's type Twitter light live demo at hashtag IO17. Tweet. Ah, success. So we see the tweet right there. Now, half of the fun is receiving retweets. Oh, thank you. Yes, yeah, successful demos are always applause worthy. Now, half the fun is receiving, you know, the like, that retweet after you've tweeted something. And one feature that's had a huge impact on this has been push notifications. So let's pull up an entirely not pre-canned tweet. Notification. All right. So Marius liked one of our tweets. You can see mobile.twitter.com at the top. Click on it. Takes us right to that tweet. Now, notifying users about recent activity is key to bring them back in the app. So this has been very important for us. And since recently adding it, we have been sending more than 10 million push notifications a day. But I could keep going for a pretty long time. But in the interest of time and keeping things light, let's send it back to Patrick. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. It was important for us to deliver a fast, engaging experience while consuming less mobile data. Twitter Lite already consumes less data as compared to our native apps. But on top of that, we launched a new feature called Data Saver. When a user is in Data Saver mode, they can save up to an additional 70% on their mobile data. Everyone benefits from lower data usage, but this is especially compelling for users in emerging markets. Now, Twitter Lite delivers all of the key features at a fraction of the size compared to our native apps. Here you can see the size difference of Twitter Lite compared to our Android and iOS apps. And of course, the mobile web is more than just a landing page. We're excited to provide a fast, feature-rich experience. And our users from around the world, from Nigeria to Japan to Ecuador, the Philippines, they love it as well. And we see it in our metrics, too. We're seeing increases in pages per session and tweets sent from Twitter Lite. And like Katie said, we're seeing more than 1 million launches from the home screen every day. Most importantly, our users are happy. Twitter Lite is our new standard mobile web experience, available to all users globally on Android and iOS. And we hope you check it out. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick and Katie. Twitter.com is a PWA, folks. The modern mobile web is truly mainstream. And it's not just Twitter. Last year, we talked about some early adopters of progressive web apps. And since then, the momentum and growth has been phenomenal. These launches are happening all over the world, and they're happening across all industry segments. Large travel companies like Expedia and Trivago and Wego have all launched progressive web apps. Publishers like Infobay and Forbes have launched progressive web apps. Forbes has seen their user engagement double since the launch of their progressive web app. E-commerce sites like Fandango, Rakuten, and Alibaba are all investing in PWAs. And even new services that we tend to think of as app-only, like ride-sharing services, have gotten in on the action. Lyft launched their progressive web app last fall. And Ola Cabs, India's largest ride-sharing service, just recently launched their PWA. And in fact, Ola will be up on stage in just a bit to show it off to you. Now, one reason progressive web apps are so successful is that multiple browsers are committed to them. So while developer adoption is growing, so is browser support. 
And if a browser you care about isn't on this list yet, progressive web apps are designed to work well everywhere. So you can always count on reaching the users that are important to you. Take the example of luxury cosmetics brand Lancome. Lancome recently launched a progressive web app, and it works great on all browsers. And they're seeing great stats. But what I want to call out here is that iOS is particularly important for Lancome because 65% of their mobile web users are on iPhones. And what Lancome observed was that those iOS users have a session length that is now 53% higher than it was before their launch. And this is despite the fact that some PWA features are not supported on that platform. Now, the progressive and progressive web apps really refers to progressive enhancement. But what it really means is that you can count on reaching the users that are important to you no matter what browser mix you care about. So the momentum and growth across the core pillars of the modern mobile web, across AMP and progressive web apps, has been truly incredible over the last 12 months. The modern mobile web is now truly mainstream. Now, while all of this momentum is happening all around us, we have been heads down working on making progressive web apps even better. Our goal is to make web apps feel more integrated into the overall device so users get a robust, no compromises experience. How are we doing this? We're adding a lot of new APIs to the web platform. In fact, we added 215 new APIs just since Google I.O. last year. But what's really important is not the number of APIs we ship. What's really important is what use cases can these APIs unlock for you? And I want to talk about three use cases today. Installing web apps to your device, paying for things on the web, and polished media experiences. Let's start with installability. We already have a way to add web apps to your home screen, but we've made it a lot better. Now, first of all, we've heard from many of you that you would like the install prompt to be more reliable and predictable, and we've heard your feedback loud and clear. So I'm happy to report that now you can show the install prompt to your users when you want. And once a user has installed your web app to their device, it shows up everywhere you expect an app to show up. They show up in the app launcher, not just the home screen. They're integrated into Android settings. They participate in the Android intent system like alongside any other native app. They can handle notifications natively rather than through Chrome. And web apps can launch in full screen mode, just like any native Android app can as well. So it's easier than ever before to install web applications to your device. So from installing web apps to your device, let's look at our second use case, paying for things on the web. Mobile payments are a big deal. Mobile commerce was worth $123 billion last year just in the US alone. And to make payment flows on the web better, we launched a one-tap payments API called Payment Request. And it works with credit cards, and it works with Google forms of payment, such as Android Pay. And many merchants are actively using this API today. But we know that credit cards are just part of the puzzle here. People have lots of different ways to pay for things. And we want to make sure that a user on the web can pay for things using the payment apps they already use. So I'm very pleased to announce that now your website can integrate with any supported payment app using Payment Request. So if a user has a native payment app installed, you can integrate that right into your payment flow on the web. We're already working with Samsung Pay and Alipay, and many other native payment apps will be integrated very soon. 
And it's not just native payment apps. We want web apps to be integrated as well. And we're actively partnering with PayPal to bring their web app right into payment request. So we want to make sure that the entire third-party payment ecosystem is available for you in your checkout flow on the web. So from installing web apps to your device and payments, let's look at our third use case, media experiences. Media is important. Over 70% of internet traffic is video. And so it's important to us that we deliver a complete solution for media on the mobile web. Now, we've been working on adding many new APIs, things like the Media Sessions API, Background Fetch, Full Screen, Orientation, and many others. And we put together a sample app to show you the kind of media experiences that are possible using these APIs. And so let me walk you through some of the highlights. First, as you can see, I've installed the app to my device. And when I tap on it, it launches in full screen mode with a splash screen. And app branding is front and center. There's no Chrome UI anywhere here. And when I tap on a video to play it, oh, actually, when I, when I scroll up and down, you can see that the app feels smooth and fluid and just works really just works in a very polished way. And when I tap on a video to play it, it plays back instantly. And this is not because the Wi-Fi is really good. It's because we prefetch the first few seconds of video so that we could enable instant playback. And if I just flip my phone over, it'll instantly enter full screen mode. And you can see this video has custom controls. So I can go backwards and forwards 30 seconds. And as I use the scrubber, you see thumbnails start to appear. And if I lock the device, you can see the background poster image. And you can see media controls appear right on the lock screen. And this could be really useful, for example, if I'm listening to audio on my morning commute. And finally, this all works really well offline as well. So if I go into airplane mode, I can view videos that I've previously saved for offline viewing, and I can tap on it, and I can play the video while I'm offline. All of this goodness is available on the mobile web today. So from installing web apps to your device, to paying for things on the web, to polished media experiences, we're working hard to make using web apps a great experience. We're also working hard to make building web apps a great experience. So here's a question. How good is your current web app? And how do you even find out? To help you answer that question, we launched a tool called Lighthouse. Lighthouse guides you along your PWA journey and runs over 100 audits against your web app, checking everything from page performance to byte efficiency to accessibility. And it even gives you a score from 0 to 100. So if you want to brag about your great Lighthouse score on Twitter, you can. It really does seem to get the competitive juices flowing. And we want to take all of the goodness of Lighthouse and make it as easy for everyone to use as possible. And so we're integrating Lighthouse right into Chrome developer tools. So you can just open it up, and you see a Lighthouse audit right there. Whether you want to tweet your score or not, I'll leave up to you. So how do you get a great Lighthouse score? Well, for one thing, your app will need to work well when you're offline or on a flaky network. And there's a powerful technology baked into browsers called Service Worker that enables this. But Service Worker is quite a low-level API and can be hard to work with directly. So to help you take full advantage of the power of Service Worker, I'd like to introduce Workbox. Workbox is a tool that we have built that enables you to, take, to get the most out of Service Worker. It builds upon existing tools, and it simplifies a number of common patterns and best practices, things like flexible caching, or managing background sync, or even collecting usage stats when the user is offline. And Workbox is completely modular and flexible so that you can just take Workbox 
integrate it into your existing tools and start using it right away. But to really max out that Lighthouse score, your app will need to do more than just work offline. It'll need to be fast. And this means that you need to be able to build and load your rich, complex application with as little extra overhead as possible. Web components are a way to build lightweight, reusable pieces of your app with very little overhead. You can create your own components, or you can reuse one of the thousands of components that already exist. Remember those amazing AMP performance numbers? AMP is based on web components. And just like we built Workbox to help you get the most out of Service Worker, we built Polymer to help you get the most out of web components. And I'm happy to announce today the launch of Polymer 2.0, the next major evolution of the Polymer library. It is a ground-up rethink that is built to take full advantage of the best new features of the modern web platform. It uses the new web component APIs that have shipped in Chrome and Safari. It embraces ES6 classes. It is completely modular. And best of all, it's 10% faster and 80% smaller. So to take a look at someone who has used Polymer to build a great progressive web app with a great Lighthouse score, let me invite up on stage Deepika Kapadia and Ratul Roy from Ola Cabs. Thanks, Rahul. Hi, everyone. I'm Deepika Kapadia, head of consumer web products. And I'm Ratul Roy, principal engineer. We are here all the way from Bangalore and really excited to tell you about Ola and our PWA. Ola is India's largest ride-hailing service with a mission to provide mobility for a billion Indians. We started six years ago out of a little apartment in Mumbai. And in those days, our co-founders would actually drive customers around when their ride didn't show up. Today, we do over a million daily rides. But even that's not enough when your mission is to move a billion Indians around. In order to do that, we needed to reach tier two, tier three cities, smaller cities with flaky networks, where users have low-end smartphones with slow processors and low memory. It's to reach, reach this audience that we built our PWA. We'd love to show you what we've built. So let's go to demo with Ratul driving. Hmm. Ratul? Let's assume we're back in Bangalore after an awesome I.O. experience and need to get a ride from the airport back to the office. Will you book us an SUV? Sure, Deepika. I'm launching the Ola PW from the home screen. It's fast, isn't it? It's asking for the browser location permission, but I'm going to go ahead and choose all the location from my saved favorites. So I'll be taking a cab from airport, to work. The reason I could do it so fast because I saved all the location as my favorites. But you, if you haven't, still you can go ahead and either search in the address bar for the location, or you can load it in the map and navigate through. If you have noticed, in order to save data, we, we load the map only when you need to. Here are the right Zipika. We have an SUV available in five minutes. Cool, but what kind of a ride are we going to get? Sure, have a look here. Sweet. I think extra leg room after this long flight back fits the bill. Sure. So guys, so far you've seen that our PWA is an immersive full page experience that's responsive to the touch, loads really fast, and supports back button navigation, much like a native app. So what do you say, guys? Shall we book a real life cab in Bangalore? It's about 5 AM there. <laughs> awesome. Ratul, do the honors, sure. please. Let me try. I'm confirming the booking, Deepika. Go for it. 
Oops, there you have it, guys. This is a real live booking in Bangalore that we just made. Thank you so much, Ratul. Sure. Nothing rigged here. <laughs> you better cancel that booking before he gets mad and shows up. Yep, I just did it. I saved some money. Awesome. OK. So the Ola PWA is only a half meg, of which the application code is just 200 KB. So how did we build this really performant app with such a small size? Let's look at that. First, we used the Polymer framework, which leverages Chrome or other browser resources and gives us blazing fast web components, DOM and CSS encapsulation using Shadow DOM, and HTML import for a very efficient 40 KB. Next, let's talk about those fast load times. What you saw right now in the demo was the repeat cached experience of the home screen, but we have a really enviable first load time of one to three seconds depending on the network, including low 3G, which is where our target audience lives. Let me show you how. As you can see on the left side here, we load our web components very strategically using a waterfall model so that we're only fetching those components that the user needs to see for his first interaction with our PWA. We're fetching in the background the other resources he needs to ensure that the experience stays snappy going forward. Once we've loaded all the components, using Workbox, we pre-cache all of these so that the repeat load time stays under a second. From this point on, the only server call that we are making is to fetch data, such as real-time cab availability, making a booking, et cetera. All of this stays under about 5 KB. We also leverage Lighthouse <laughs> and web page test. And we are planning to integrate Lighthouse in our build, because obviously we'll add more features to the app. So here you can see our Lighthouse score. Sure. Sure. <laughs> we are very, very proud of this score. And we optimize for a perfect score. Um, and we can totally relate to developers wanting to tweet and brag about theirs. <laughs> So how's our PWA doing for us? Well, we've been out for about a month now, and we're seeing that our conversion or rides booked in tier two cities is comparable to our native app. But what's great to see is that in tier three cities, smaller cities, our conversion is actually 30% higher than our native app, which shows that clearly we are solving for network issues and the need for low data usage, which is inherent in these geographies. We've also seen mobile traffic increase by 68% in these cities since we launched, which shows that we are expanding our reach. But what surprised even us is that 20% of our PWA bookings comes from users who have previously uninstalled our native app. So this shows that our PWA can even be a great re-engagement tool. So there you have it, guys. Our PWA has been a win-win for our customers and for Ola. So I hope sharing our journey inspires many of you to build your own progressive web app. And the next time you're in India, remember to book your ride on Ola. Thank you. Thank you. Here you go, Ram. Great. Thank you, Deepika and Ratul, and congratulations to the team at Ola. So folks, there you have it. Amazing momentum on the core pillars of the modern mobile web, AMP and PWAs. New APIs unlocking new experiences and new use cases, everything from installing web apps to your device, to paying for things on the web, to polished media experiences. And looking ahead, Computing continues to evolve at a fast clip. And we at Google want to make sure that we can help developers take advantage of these changes, whether they're building native apps or building for the web. And just like we do with native apps, we want the web to be a great platform for future technologies as they evolve. One such future technology is VR. 
Virtual reality enables the creation of richly imagined worlds that you can fully immerse yourself in. And through the WebVR API, all of this expressive power is available on the web. WebVR enables companies like Within to showcase these amazing VR explorations from creators around the world right in your browser. WebVR enables companies like Sketchpad to bring you these amazing, stunning VR scenes to explore. They have over 1.5 million of these. Now, these would be truly mind-blowing if you all had VR headsets on, but you get a sense of what is possible. WebVR is now fully supported in Chrome, and most major browser vendors have announced their support as well. And looking even further ahead, we see the advent of AR, augmented reality, a way to connect information to the physical world. So no matter how computing evolves and changes in the future, the web will always be here as a way for you to reach your users at scale. If you want to dig in more, we have a lot of great sessions on the mobile web at I.O. this year. And even after I.O. is done, come and talk to us. Tell us what you're working on. Tell us what your challenges are. We are here to help you be successful on the web. It's amazing to see how far we've come over the last 12 months. The modern mobile web is now mainstream, and I can't wait to see what happens in the next 12 months. Thank you very much. Everybody, David here, and today I have a quick and easy Firecast for you. We're going to get up and running with Firebase and the web. And this is actually going to be the first of many screencasts in a series. So make sure you subscribe to get notified of tutorials on authentication, storage, hosting, and web push notifications with Firebase Cloud Messaging. 
Also, if you're a fan of JavaScript frameworks, I'm gonna be dropping videos for Angular 1 and 2, Polymer, React, and Ember. So you better subscribe because you don't wanna miss those. But today we're gonna to start with the very basics. I'm gonna show you some mad copy and pasting skills by getting the project initialization code from the Firebase console. And then we're going to set up a small web app. So let's go and dive in. So I'm in the Firebase console at console.firebase.google.com. You can see I'm logged in as myself up here, just smiling at you. But to get started, I'm going to create a new project. So I'm gonna click create new project. I'm gonna call it web quick start. And then we'll create it. My project is now created. So I'm gonna click add Firebase to your web app. And this brings up a little model with all the initialization code I need to get started. It has things like my API key, auth domain, database URL, and storage bucket. So then I can go to the bottom right and then I can click copy. And that's all the code I need to get started. But just as a little FYI, you can access all of this information by clicking auth and then going up to the top right where there's web setup. But now to the editor. So here are my editor. I'm gonna get crazy. I'm gonna create this web page from scratch. So I'll start with my basic HTML boilerplates, give it a title. And now I can just paste in all the code from the console. And this is all you need to get started. And just to prove that it works, I'm gonna use the database as a little tiny demo. So I'm gonna create an H1 and give it an ID. And every single time the value changes in the real-time database, I'm going to sync it to this H1. So the first thing I need to do is get that H1 by its ID. And then now I'm gonna create a database reference using firebase.database.ref and then create a child location to the text location. And now I can synchronize any changes using the on function. And then using ES2015 arrow functions, I can just do it all in one line. So to the left right here, I have my project in the Firebase console and to the right is just my blank page. To use the database, I'm gonna remove all security. So I'm gonna click rules and then I'm going to say read is true and write is true and click publish. And you should totally know that you should only do this while you're developing because that means anyone can read or write to your database. So now I'm gonna give my browser a refresh and then I'm going to add a text location and it synchronizes to the browser. And so I can change it and then it changes as well. So keep in mind that the real-time database is just one of the many features Firebase offers for the web. You can also use authentication, storage, hosting, and even Firebase cloud messaging. So that's all it takes to get started with Firebase in the web. And if you wanna go and learn more, then check out the link in the description for our official documentation. And if you're super excited to learn more about Firebase on the web, then please subscribe to our channel because we're gonna have tons of more content. So that's all for this time, and I will see you all later. We started is on our living room couch, and we really started because of the problem that we had, which was asking the same question to our closest friends. Where are you? What are you doing? We were baffled by the fact that there wasn't a solution that solve this problem and we felt like we could build one that was better. The value that is drives for all users is knowing which of your friends are nearby. So if you look around where we are right now in arena, how many times have people gone to a basketball game, hockey game, or a concert and found out the next day that they had friends were at the same event? And think about all those moments that are missed because they didn't know they had friends there. So what we're solving is letting people know who's nearby and making those moments matter. My name is Diesel Peltz, and I'm the founder and CEO of Is. I'm Mark French, co-founder of Is. We felt there was no reason users should manually go fetch data. When I get a text message, there's no reason for me to tap refresh. And we felt, why should it be different from anything else? And Firebase let us solve that. Firebase really allowed us to enhance user experience by making it real time, simplify the UI by not having a refresh button and cut down on development time. Like any startup, the most valuable asset that you have is your team and your time. And what Firebase has allowed us to do is save 50% in terms of time by moving that much quicker with a product. It's a game changer. We're using eight 
features from Firebase right now. There are analytics, remote config, dynamic links, the real-time database, and more. Traditionally, that would have been in eight different places. And now we go to one place, which is the Firebase console. We're eager to launch this product in a big way. We're seeing how people are using the product and how they're inviting more and more friends that we're concerned. We're growing very, very quickly. So we sleep a lot easier at night knowing that we got Firebase that's really there to build that infrastructure. If you're a developer, use it. We love it, and it's enabled us to focus on developing the user experience and not have to worry about the things in the background that should be there. Yeah, with NPR One, we are reimagining what a listening experience could be outside of the radio. It's the radio, but better. It has all of the great stuff that we've spent 40 years perfecting. With NPR One, we see the opportunity of reaching a more diverse audience that have a device in their pocket at all times. My name is Mike Saiflahi. I'm the lead mobile developer for NPR Digital Media. My name is Nick Dupre, and I'm the innovation accountant at NPR. My name is Tejas Mystery, and I'm the senior product manager of NPR One. So some of the biggest challenges in any mobile app are that first impression. When the user first installs the app, you've got a very limited amount of time to convince them to keep the app and to get engaged in the experience. Trying to figure out how we can get users into the content as quickly as possible was the real focus of integrating Firebase and Dynamic Links. Using Dynamic Links, we were able to shorten the number of interactions it takes for a user installing the app to get from the promoted content to the content from 20 to 3. So that user is able to get right into the content. We're driving more and more listening per user every week. It's really astounding. Creating playlists of content that are configured by the podcaster or by a member station or by us internally. And with Firebase, we have that at our hands. Having the analytics product interact with things like dynamic links, remote configuration, cloud messaging, it adds a real multiplier effect. And the integration with the broader Firebase suite, I don't have to go outside the platform to figure out what's working. So it's not just about shipping the product faster, it's about analyzing the results faster. And with the integration with all the other Firebase products, we're really excited about all the things we can learn from it. Raise Labs is a company that is focused on building excellence in software, technology, and design. We do that through our work on mobile applications and websites and technologies in general. My name is Gregory Reyes. I'm the CEO and founder of Raise Labs. We really want to understand the human problem, and oftentimes the hard problems in software aren't just the technology problems, the API, the how do you connect these things, but really getting at the heart of what people are trying to accomplish and do in their day to day. My name is Ben Johnson. I'm the managing director at Ray's Labs in Boston. We decided to put our hat in the ring for the Google Certified Agency Program. The first leg is just having access to a lot of what Google is doing today. So there's uh, access to design reviews, invitations to events, and that's sort of the base level. And I think that's hugely rewarding even in and of itself. Having Google review your app from a design perspective is amazingly helpful. So that's sort of the first tier. The second tier comes with certified status. Uh, you know, there's a long application process for that. And once you have it, it's something that you can really say to your clients uh, that gives them comfort that we're a reputable firm, that we're building great software in a way that Google believes in. The certification is a higher bar for us to really differentiate ourselves from many of the other companies out there. It required us to really dig into what that means to be truly world class, and we wanted to set that bar for ourselves as well. My name is John Green. I'm a VP Creative at Raise Labs. The Google Developer Agency Program allowed us to have access to uh, engineers for the map team, the design team, to figure out, oh, how can we actually do some of these things? And we could reach out to them when we needed. And also it allowed us to set up and say, we can make this a success. They might look closer at this app because we're part of this program, which has actually been uh, super helpful. 
Some of the challenges in building the Six Flags app, and we touched on some of these, are certainly mapping technology and payment technology, material design, or the APIs. Uh, having access to the Google team to really ascertain how we're approaching certain software and ensuring that we're building technologies the right way makes for a smooth development process. We set off to build the Six Flags app with a pretty lofty ambition, and it was to bring in-park navigation and commerce to the app. The comfort of knowing that Google is there to help us understand where they are heading as an organization and that we are along for that ride is a really uh, helpful thing to know. And as a business, we know that uh, going forward, we're going to be at the cutting edge of whatever Google is doing through access to programs, through uh, you know, the collaboration with their teams. It's really helpful for us to know that six months, nine months down the road, we'll still be a part of that uh, process and we'll still be working with them to figure out what's next. So here we are in the sandbox. I'm so glad that you'll be here with us for the next three days as we explore everything on the ground at Google I.O. Uh, first off is the mocktail mixer. It's not getting started early because there's no alcohol. Chris, would you tell me about this? Excellent, thanks Timothy. So this was a do-it-yourself uh, mixer that has the Google Assistant built in. It was part of a collaboration between the assistant team and Deep Local, these guys behind you. Um, it's a creative agency out of Pittsburgh. And what they've done is they've used the Google Assistant SDK, which we launched three weeks ago, and actions on Google to customize the drink, the drink ingredients, and the code, as well as services like API.ai, to create a conversational interface so you can have a natural interaction with the mixer. So we're super cool. It's a super cool demo. It shows you how to go from zero to prototyping in a matter of hours. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about this demo and the SDK and like all the things that we can do with it. But first, let's make a drink. You want to make a drink? Okay, let's give it a shot. <laughs> Let's talk to Mocktail's Mixer. Sure, here is the test go. version of Mocktail's Mixer. Hi, I'm your Mocktail's Mixer. <laughs> What's on the menu? On tap today, I have a pairing mode in Mang I.O. What can I get you? Let's get a pairing mode. Coming right up. Initiating ones and zeros. Beep boop. Bop. <laughs> is that the robot sounds it's making? <laughs> yeah, so it's actually like, it's going from my voice going through this mic, through uh, the Assistant SDK running on a Raspberry Pi device, which I think Oscar will talk a little bit more about, going back to the Assistant Services server running in the cloud, and figuring out what I'm saying, doing natural language understanding and speech recognition, and then basically coming back and controlling the devices. And now you see, we've started making the pairing mode drinks for everybody around here. That's awesome. There's, okay, there's a bunch of drinks. So uh, we have some other friends joining us. Uh, let's start with Oscar. Oscar, you're one of the guys that actually built this. Yeah, so I work for Deep Local. We worked, like Chris said, with the SDK team on the project. And basically the way this works is there's a Raspberry Pi inside the device that runs the SDK. And when you speak with it, it runs up to API AI where you can program your conversational interface. From there, there's a web hook that's called that when you call a drink, it pushes a message over Google PubSub down to the devices and actually sends a serial command to the Arduinos inside. That is actually what controls the motors and dispenses the liquid. That was like a design doc in five sentences. <laughs> yeah, Thank you. Exactly. <laughs> and everything's open source and online, so you can find it on GitHub if you search for Mocktails Mixers, or if you go to deeplocal.com slash Mocktails Mixers, there's a write-up and a video and DIY instructions so the home builder can make it themselves. That's Wayne. Wayne, you're the home builder. I am a little bit, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, Wayne, you are one of the developer advocates working on Assistant and the SDK and all these yeah. APIs. Um, is this what you do all the time? Well, I made a dog feeder one time, but this is new. i got to get into this now. I can imagine something where you could like, mix up custom food or something like that. That would be kind of cool. You made a dog feeder. They made a human feeder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to merge them together now, right? That's the cool thing is because this SDK is available to the public, you know, anyone can build devices like this now. It's what I'm quite excited about it too. I said I need to go home and work out my next plan for some kind of dog feeder. Well, that's the really cool thing about this recent release. Like, the SDK just came out uh, a few weeks ago, right? Yeah. Three weeks ago. And uh, it's really giving the ability for people to bring the assistant into their own hardware. Yeah, yeah 
exactly. I mean, you can take any crazy idea that you've got and you can embed the Assistant SDK into it, run it on, runs on most you know, Linux operating systems and so forth, and it's just really easy to get started. And we've got a whole bunch of samples, people can try it out. All the demos here, we have other demos as well, they're all open source so people can try them out. And uh, again, just like sort of taking a look at the value of that, it's really, this is something that people have been doing before, but they had to build the whole stack themselves, yeah. right? Which includes a lot of technologies that they don't want to really be experts in, um, but Google can be that expert for them, and you can just use the APIs instead. Well, then you, can, you can focus on what you're good at, which is making these kinds of devices, and leave all the speech recognition and the natural language understanding to, to us, and we take care of it for you. Awesome. Are the drinks ready? Oh, they, I see they're, they're getting poured out. Oh, they're still pouring, nice. Okay, well, we're waiting for the drinks. Uh, Vera, tell me about um, some of the ways that people are using the Assistant today. Awesome. So today we at I.O. we announced that the Assistant is fundamentally conversational. So everything that we're seeing here that Wayne mentioned, that it's natural language processing, you're able to actually, as a user, talk to the Assistant, and the Assistant can do things for you. And so uh, the Assistant is live across devices like this through our Open SDK, but it's also live across Android, and we announced an iOS app, so you can get it on your iPhone, and it's also live on wearables and soon TVs, cars, etc. Um, and the Assistant can actually do so uh, as a part of our developer platform, Actions on Google. The Assistant can order cabs for you or make table reservations or even set up your smart home so it can clean your apartment. Um, and so we're really excited about what developers will build on top of the, the platform to help users. That's awesome. I think the drinks are ready. I, drink I sure do. Yeah. This is the, what, which drink is this? The pairing, the pairing mode. mode. First pairing, pairing mode. mode. Cheers. I get Cheers. it. Cheers. It's on. pretty fantastic. It it I'm impressed. It was made with <laughs> what was that? It tastes better because it was made with technology. <laughs> <laughs> That's putting absolutely right. Putting artificial intelligence into your drinks. Done. <laughs> so I'm going to drink a little bit more of this, but maybe while I do that, can you talk about where you see this going? Like, what are you most excited about developers doing with this technology? Yes, it's a great question. So what we um, envision is a ubiquitous assistant experience so that when you need help or need something to, do, to be done in your life, that you can just ask the question and it'll happen, right? And so for that experience to, to really surface, you need to have the assistant in multiple places in your life. And we don't expect a Google Home to be in every corner of your house. And we also don't expect Google to build all of the appliances in your house. It just doesn't make any sense. So what we need to do is we need, we need to empower a diverse ecosystem of device manufacturers embedding the assistant in their devices then you can have the assistant available to you when you need it, wherever you need it, however you need it. So that's really where we see this going longer term. And the Assistant SDK and Actions on Google and API.ai are just the beginnings of where we're going. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And uh, to y'all out there, cheers. cheers. Hi, everybody. I'm Ben Poise. I'm the product manager for Android Framework. I like how everybody's right over there. I wish I could join you. The sun's going to come and get me. Um, what, what I want to talk to you guys about is uh, background limits and a lot of the, the infrastructure that we've put in place in O. And it, it's a starting point. And I wanted to try and have this talk give you a glimpse as to how we're approaching the problem. And so you don't just think we're trying to like, ruin all, all the apps and everything you're doing in the background. We're actually trying to find a balance of enabling uh, users to have battery life they can rely on, and enabling developers to do the use cases that they think are, are great and that users respond positively to. 
And so to do that, we're going to talk a little bit about the past, a, bit about, a lot about the present, and then a bit about the future, where for one of the few times, we're going to give you a, a glimpse of the, the space that we're trying to, to go longer term. So in the past, we have Doze and, and Standby. Um, Doze and Doze Lite were introduced to try and save battery in two main conditions, um, one being when the device is off for a long period of time. So a good example of this is I take my tablet, I toss it in my desk, and it sits there for a few days. Um, in that, you really want the device to last a long time. And Doze was introduced to, to make that device last up to a week. And it was, it was largely successful um, when it was introduced. Do Doze Lite was trying to take that same concept and apply that to the my phone is in my pocket. It's not on, but it is on me. Um, and Doze wasn't identifying that situation. And Doze Lite was trying to target that. And to start slowing down applications and limiting what's happening throughout the day. And App Standby was very similar in, in concept, but then about is the user interacting with the application very often? And if not, begin throttling that, that back. Um, we also looked at broadcast removal. And this was when we targeted a, an initial set of three um, particular broadcasts. And the best example of this was you know, we were finding you take a photo, and suddenly all the applications are getting really excited about that photo um, because they're listening to that broadcast. And they would all be waking up and going, what's going on with the photo? Is there a restaurant nearby? Is, should I back it up? What should happen? And the user's going, like, I'm, I'm really just trying to take a photo. Like, God forbid you're trying to take two photos, because the first photo triggered everybody to wake up, and the second photo is now this resource contention. Um, and so we found this was really successful to pull these guys back from being these general broadcasts and instead being a bit more targeted. And, and so that's kind of like the lead in to then the present, um, where we started looking at then a general strategy for background limits. Um, I'll also talk about alert window as well, which has a very similar problem space. Um, and then a bit about how we're trying to bring a data-based approach to improving system health on Android. Um, I don't mean health like my personal health, um, but more like the device health. Um, and then the, the, I'll, I'll pepper in a few best practices as we go, as we go through. So background limits, why? Um, so what we're trying to do is, is two parts. Um, one is to save battery. Um, this one was largely around the limits that we put in place for location. And the, the goal that we're trying to get at is we want multi-day battery life. Um, that's what's going to take us a while to get there. But that's where we're trying to go. And to do that, we know we have a pretty large task in terms of what's happening in the background. It's a nearly 6 to 8% efficiency improvement from where we are today. And so that's like the, the backdrop, if you will, of how we're, how we're thinking about it. And, the, and these are the kind of initial steps in setting the framework for how we're going to get there. Um, the other part is about RAM management and working on how um, broadcasts are being fired to applications and also dealing with uh, how applications are running in the background with long-running services. So just to give you a, a concrete example of this is you have this chart of screen off performance uh, over, over time. And the one thing you can see up here, I can't see my monitors anymore. The sun has totally killed me up here. Um, but the one thing you can see up there is over time, you're going to have a, a slide of your screen off battery performance the longer the phone is in the field. You'll also see that the jank, jank rates, the slow UI frames, get higher the longer the device is in the field. And so these are things that we really want to help remedy and make, add robustness into the platform so we can really smooth these out. Like, obviously, over time, devices age, and, and physics comes into play, and the march of time happens. But we really don't want them to be anywhere near that steep. Um, another example of this is as a device is on, in the course of even days, this one's measured all um, in initially hours and then in days, you can see just uptime starts to take a toll on the device. And so these are the things that we're really trying to target and to improve. So let's, let's dig in a little bit to some of the changes that we're introducing. Um, background limits and on the save RAM part is we want to restrict services and broadcasts, and we want to reduce the amount of churn that's happening on the device. And the save battery, we're looking to improve uh, background location scan rates and Wi-Fi scan rates and to reduce them and make them be more of a, a trickle than these really bursty events that we're seeing happening in the, in, in the ecosystem. Um, so for, for background limits, the, the big one here is we want to reduce that RAM usage. And to do that is, well, this slide's like the same. I should just skip. So, so how we're doing that is with broadcast receivers. Um, by pulling these guys back, you're able to then say, OK, oh, oh, all these broadcasts before that were implicit in waking up applications are going to be silenced. You're, if you're running at the moment, you're still going to get them. But if you're not currently running, we're not going to wake you up for them, except in the case where they're explicit. 
Um, in explicit ones, we, we say something really important has happened, or you've been targeted, or you've registered for a, a, some wake up, and those things will still work completely as normal as, the, as they do before. Um, and so that follows like alarms and notifications. Um, other ones that we're still keeping around, boot completed, um, locale changing, and these are really events that are not happening as the user is trying to do something else. And that's really been the target of how we approach which things should continue to work and which things should we start deferring. The, the other one here is free running background services should no longer be a thing. And, and the idea behind that is we want users to have visibility to what's happening on their phone. And so if an application is doing something really expensive in the background, we want there to be some awareness for the user. We don't want the device to be toiling away in the background without any awareness. Um, this also means we want to then start stopping those services after they're running for a little bit. We want to start throwing, uh, we're going to start throwing an exception if you start to start a background service uh, when you're not in the foreground or when you don't have a foreground service running. And this is also the very last one is we'll start releasing wake locks under some more conditions. You still want to manage wake locks. For, don't, don't think the OS is going to handle it for you, but we are adding more protections in different scenarios where they might have been leaked or the, the developer was a little lax in, in their cleanup. The, we still have a, the whitelisting strategy that we had before. So there will still be um, a whitelisting strategy that is around when GCM fires off uh, a broadcast to your application. You'll still get woken up. Um, you'll get a, a short exemption to handle that message. From there, you can kick off a service. You can bring your application to the foreground if it's appropriate. Um, or you can just take, the, take a note, um, run a, schedule a job or alarm, and, and ha have it be scheduled by the OS and happen you know, when it happens. Um, there's also the flexibility still for OEMs. If you're relying on some OEM-specific intent or something behavior that's not built into AOSP, um, Android Open Source, the OEM will be able to define on, on their own which things are explicit, which things are implicit, and should still be fired, and which things are implicit and should still get the, the brakes tapped on them. So you, you might be thinking at this point, like, this all, is, I guess, the user part of my brain is really, really happy, probably. The developer side's going, wait, I, need, I have things to do. I have things to say. How can I communicate to the, to the developer? Like, it's really important, Ben. What are you doing? And so there's a number of strategies, and I'll talk about them right now, um, of how to do these operations still with the user on a timely basis and be, still be respectful of the battery, but then also be able to tell the user, no, I'm doing something incredibly important. So the, the first one to look at is using uh, Firebase in, or in Google Cloud Messaging. And the, using the high priority and normal priority messages. Um, I hope your takeaway from this slide is not like fire all torpedoes at high priority. Um, we really want you to be kind of balanced and saying, if something is important, like say my fire alarm is going off at home and I want to send a notification to the user, use a high priority notification. It's kind of a big deal. Um, if you're, say, using a, oh, the user's scheduled for a TV show that they like, and that TV show is now available, um, and they can stream it at their leisure. Use a normal priority notification. And it's, it'll make a big difference in the, ba in the battery life of the device. And it really adds up when the ecosystem starts taking these approaches. The other one here is um, something new. It's called a job intent service. And this is uh, coming out. We, we just missed the window, but I still wanted to talk about it um, for, for what came out with the, the new 26 uh, beta. But it will be coming out shortly before O launch. And it, it's a strategy of you can use job intent service uh, on O to give you backwards compat support so that you will use then uh, jobs when you're on O, and you'll have an automatic fallback to using services pre-O. Um, the really nice part about this when you have that fallback is we'll handle the wake locks for you. Um, so you don't have to worry about, are you going to make a leak or make a mistake there? Um, so t definitely take a look at this when it comes out. It's going to make your lives a lot easier um, to adopt. Uh, the other last one here is about alarms, syncs, and job scheduling. Um, these are all good strategies to uh, run jobs on a, on a cadence in the background that gives the OS flexibility about when it runs. So as I give you an example, if, if all these applications before, when we had a world of these broadcasts being fired and that applications could start services, they'll all start at the same time. And the OS really has only nukes to deal with this problem. We can only kill your process. Um, there's no ability to throttle. We can't try to uh, squish RAM. It's just you live or you die. And when RAM becomes contentious, we start thrashing um, pretty rapidly. When you're using jobs and alarms, the OS has now flexibility to defer, to run one job at a time, a few jobs at a time, and spread it out across the lifetime of the device. And that avoids then resource contention. It avoids janky UI in the foreground because stuff is happening in the background. So I've made this really exciting flowchart for you um, that you can look at, look at later. But the idea behind it is um, roughly looking at what are the different stages that are happening 
and what is the right choice um, for you as a developer and for the user to have like, the, the best, most efficient experience for the use case that you're trying to achieve. Yes, the end of this is maybe you shouldn't do it in the background. Um, and that, that's, that's the one I really want you to focus on, is think about, do I really have to be doing this? Is the user going to understand what I'm trying to do? If the user is going to understand what you're trying to do, and a great example of this are like navigation apps, music playing apps, various uh, ex ex exercise applications, all of those scenarios, if you're running a foreground service and the user sees a notification, it's going to make sense to them. You're going to be really well aligned. So in those scenarios, please go do that. In other ones where you're like, I don't know how to explain this to a user, then you should definitely be considering jobs or just be considering not running it in the background at all. So transitioning, that, that was the, the battery saving and executions portion. And now we're going to transition a little bit to talk about um, location limits. And, and the idea here was to put some upper bounds on what we're seeing happening in the background around geofencing, polling, um, and others. And, and it was causing really a, a significant amount of, of drain. And, and, the, and the reason is location is, is power hungry. And there were really no functional limits on what an application could do when it's in the background um, with respect to location. And so it would end up with two different types of scenarios. We'd have, and most of them, to be honest, are, are accidental. One, one being is that applications are aggressively requesting location. Um, and this could be because they, they, they're interested in where you are or they have a particular use case. But the, the one that was you know, really sad um, was this idea of leaks, um, is that if you're running in the foreground, you're, say you're navigating, you're going to have a really high rate of, of query. And when you go to the background, that high rate maybe isn't necessary anymore. And the intention of the developer was to reduce it. But for one reason or another, similar memory leaks or wake lock leaks, it's still running full blast. And that we saw a lot of a lot of applications pulling at once every second, getting a location request. And that's just going to completely destroy battery. And so those are the two areas we're trying to, to target here. So the, the idea now is not to say that you can't run in the background, because we're still enabling that. But the idea is to space it out once every 30 minutes with a cycle of accuracy of two to three minutes within those 33 updates, 30 minute updates. So you can think of it as you have a 30 minute delay roughly within an update accuracy of two to three minutes within that 30 minute cycle. Um, the same thing will apply with Wi-Fi. The API is a little bit different. We don't have the kind of convenience for scheduling. But the idea is if you're banging on the Wi-Fi um, scanning query, you'll keep getting the same results if you're going too fast. We won't actually do the query. Um, and so th those are the two strategies that we've taken for, for location and for, and for Wi-Fi. Um, so just to highlight, you know, there's, there's a number of options here that are uh, lower battery impacting that you should be looking at. One is batching, batching um, geofencing. And in the complete last case, again, is to consider the foreground service. If you are using the foreground service and the user understands what's happening, that's, that's really kind of critical. Um, but if they understand what's happening, that will then enable them to say, oh, OK, yeah, you're running in the background. You're expensive. I get it. Moving on. Um, but, and you'll have relaxed, requ relaxed requirements when you're in that mode. So the other thing I wanted to talk about, take a moment, I know it feels like a lot about battery, and then suddenly I'm talking about alert window. But um, I want to take a moment to talk about it, is there's a number of, of use cases that this is coming up with. And to be brutally honest with you, this was only intended for what the name is, system alert windows. Um, it was never really uh, consciously intended to be used the way that it has been. Um, but we were in a simpler world in API 1, and it was left public. And people have found really amazing uh, ideas and solutions using this API. And so we don't want to get rid of it. However, we do want to try and put it on Rails. Um, what we're really worried about is many applications rendering on top of each other, conflicting with each other. Um, there's no attribution of what applications happen to be rendering at any point in time. And so the idea was that can we add some layering? Can we add some attribution um, within the model? And that's what we did with the application overlay. And so the idea here is with an app overlay is the user can now manage what is floating above the, their application activity. Um, it's z-ordered properly unto themselves and to system UI and to the application below. Um, and then we'll automatically show a foreground notification in, in the notification menu so the user is aware if there are multiple applications simultaneously using this feature. Um, this way, if they see it, they're unhappy with it, they can go to the application, control the settings if they want. Um, you should always make sure your users are aware of using this, because it can be kind of surprising if it doesn't happen. Um, and the, the other thing that we changed was uh, for targeting on O is if you are now using this new overlay type, um, you will then see, sit above the legacy views. So this is maybe your incentive to adopt a new model, um, is once you're using that, everybody will be properly z-ordered in a kind of LRU fashion. 
Um, and then you'll set below system UI, but above things like the keyboard and, and other uh, system UI components. So now I want to transition a little bit about talking about how we're going to improve the system with, with data. And you know, th I don't mean to, to blame anyone, because it's not. Um, that's not my intent. But th it's really a, a story about applications, and that phones are amazing. And you can do so many things with this portable computing device. However, we have resource scarcity, mostly in the, fr in the frame of battery. And the question then comes up, well, then how do, how do we balance this? And the big thing that we, we realized, and you might be thinking at your seat, like, yeah, no duh, thanks. Um, but there really isn't great tooling up until very recently to help developers understand their impact. And when we reached out even internally at Google, we would find they didn't realize they were doing it. They, and so that, that kind of brought around a number, a number of thoughts that I'll get into in a moment. Um, and the, the other one is this kind of tragedy of the commons and that you have so many applications on your phone. And if any of those applications say, stick a wake lock, that can, we only need one to do it, and the cost is now your CPU is unable to go to sleep, and you'll have a very precipitous drain on your battery over time. And when you have hundreds of apps, and only one needs to make a mistake, you're pretty much guaranteed to have a bad time. And so what we started looking at is, is how can we get to a point of sustaining performance, introducing accurate measurements for developers, and bringing online new dashboards. So let's, let's dig in a little bit into what these are. And there's a talk on bad behaviors. It was earlier in the day. If you haven't seen it, please go hop on YouTube and go take a look at it. It's very, very good. The guys that presented it are right here in front, um, staring at me. So it's good. Thank you. Uh, but the, the big one here is we're looking for egregious behavior that we can all agree on. And so a good example of this is, is wake locks, is if you ask a developer, you were holding a wake lock for six hours straight. You weren't in the foreground, and the user wasn't interacting with your application. And pretty much everybody says, yeah, I shouldn't have been doing that. Um, and so the, the trick, though, is there wasn't really good instrumentation to help you understand that, that was happening. And that's where the, the Play Console is coming, in, coming into, into its own and bringing out these features. So you can now see these type of situations that are happening. Um, other big one has been um, really severely janking frames, so frozen frames. Frames take over 700 milliseconds to run. Also really hard to figure out where in your application they're occurring. And even if they're occurring, and if they're occurring, what devices they're occurring on. And then the last one was around crash looping and a number of other crash, uh, crash states. Um, the other one is we're also looking at the OS side, not to say that everything is about apps. It's not. Um, we do have to bring a level of sanity and attribution um, to the operating system. One you know, good example of that was the improvements we made in boot time and really looking hard at how the OS is structured. And the other one is also going to be starting looking at I.O. throughput, um, how many scans are happening in the background and different parameters. And all these things will start coming out and being available for you guys over the, over the coming years. So just to give you an, an example of this, uh, I have a selection of Google Apps. Uh, I have hidden the names to protect the innocent slash guilty. Um, but what I have put up there is a hash line. And the hash line is effectively the, the threshold that you're going to see of when we say an application has crossed into the territory of bad behavior. Um, so you can see the majority of applications in this cross section. And these are all major Google apps. Um, most of them are, are quite good. And there's a few outliers um, that are having issues where a wake lock is getting stuck on their applications. And you can see the percentages here. Like, they look small. But when you see these numbers of like half a percent here, 1% there, those are just one app. And as I mentioned before, only one app needs to make this mistake for your entire device to suffer. Multiply that by the 100 apps. If you work out the ratio, you're going to have a bad time. The, the next one here was talking about foreground crashes and helping our developers understand repeat crashes, repeat offenders, rapid crashing in a cycle. We generally had good instrumentation to help developers understand if you crash, but not necessarily the severity of repeated crashes versus uh, sporadic crashes. Uh, do I have a population of 5% crashing really extremely, or does it really spread across a population of 95%? The, and the very last one here is about frozen frames. Um, and you can see another example of most applications are actually doing pretty good. And in this case, there was one who was a little not as good. Um, and when we pass this data along to the team, they're like, crap. Um, not, not their intent, obviously. Um, but it really makes the experience of the device uh, not, not really that fantastic, especially their application. And it makes the users go under, like, is my device wrong? Is the app bad? What's happening? Um, so giving this information back to developers, then they're able to start remedi remedying these problems and solving them. So the big thing here is, is visibility. And this is visibility both for you guys as well as for the, the user on their device. 
Um, so new developer tools. We're also out do doing a lot of outreach, both internally and externally, with BizDev to, to reach out to teams and inform them, hey, do you know this is happening in your apps? And in many cases, we, just, we don't, and it's an easy, it's a quick fix, and so, especially when it comes to wake clocks. It's usually a fairly straightforward fix once you know which wake clock is the one that's been stuck. Um, and the la last one here is battery, battery settings in the Play Store, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then OEM dashboards, is we also want to get this data over to OEMs so they can see what's going on, and they can make sure their devices are intrinsically good, and that you have a strong base to work on, that you're not seeing jank because of the device freaking out, but you're, seeing, you're having a good experience, um, and that you have you know, the ability to control your own destiny. So battery menu on here is about, uh, this is the new O battery menu, and it was redesigned with the idea of being actionable for users. We wanted to make sure that if you go to this menu, you don't go, OK, I see uh, Google Play services, the settings, uh, Android OS, and the screen. And you're like, what am I supposed to think if I see this? Um, there's really nothing actionable here. And, the, and while it was technically accurate, um, it wasn't necessarily useful to what you're trying to do, is to understand how, what applications are impacting your battery life. So we, this is how we restructured it. And we also included, though, your foreground interaction with those applications. And this is something that happens really quite commonly. And, and I'll give you just a quick anecdote from uh, internally. I had a bug filed to me, and it was about Android O battery life. It's horrible. I don't make it past 3 o'clock. What's going on? And you know, dig into their bug report, look at what's going on. And what happened on their device was they were playing Pokemon Go for two hours on Thursday at 1 PM. And I was, my reply was like, that's pretty amazing that you got this much battery life out of Pokemon Go um, on your phone. Um, also, it was Thursday at 1 PM, um, Googler. Um, but you know, the, the thing was that, that I took away was they didn't realize they played it that long. Um, and so that was happening quite often. You'd see an app behind your battery drain, but you don't necessarily recognize, oh, it was because I used my phone like an extra hour today. And it's hard to remember how long did I really have the screen on. And so that's how we really structured batteries to help inform you of how long you're using the device, how long you're using different applications, and so that you can make this uh, like comparison of what is happening in the apps. We don't want to pass judgment on an application being good or bad. It's not necessarily a bad thing if an app uses 20% of your battery. If you were live streaming an event, that's pretty decent, especially if it was for an hour or two. Um, so we're not trying to say intrinsically things are bad if they're high, but we do want to add some visibility so that a user can see, this is an app I didn't engage with for days. Why is it taking up 5% of my battery? Um, and then those questions can start happening on the user's part and giving you guys feedback, and then you can see the same data in the Play Console. So this is where I will transition to talking a little bit about the future to have to, so you can kind of get an idea of where we're going. Um, this is also my, my suggestion to really look at background limits, to look at targeting O, to transitioning away from background services to jobs, alarms, GCM, uh, et cetera. And, and the thing is, we want to get to this amazing battery life that I started out with, multi-day battery life. And to do that, there's a few things we're going have to have to change, if you will. Um, but if, I want to talk about some principles. One is we fundamentally believe applications should be able to run in the background. We want much more well-defined rules about when applications are able to run. Um, today, you can see a number of OEMs taking strategies trying to solve this problem independently. And it becomes really difficult for developers to deal with that world when you don't necessarily know what the rules are. So we want to get a lot crisper there. We also want users to better understand battery impact. Uh, you, could also, you could argue my previous statements about the settings menu was like what the user has to like do math in their head about how much time that it used and how much battery it used. And I agree with you completely. We want to get to a better place where it's much easier for a user to understand what's happening. Um, and we want to then enable a user who says, I'm not OK with this. And if the application doesn't offer the control, to give them another option than uninstalling the application. Um, something other than just the nuclear option. And then the last one is we really want this idea of consistent device performance, that you shouldn't be worrying, will my device make it through the day today or not? Um, will it be able to make it till I get home on charger? We want that to be something reliable. Um, one of the, like, all these use cases that we're doing on phones and, and all the properties from Google and all the properties that you're making as app developers, you can't really rely on this stuff unless you know your phone's going to be there. And so that's, that's really the, the underpinning uh, for this general strategy. And so how do we get there? So there's three kind of big tiers. Is we have to consider what is the API contract. Um, we don't want to break the promises we make to you. 
However, we do make a lot of promises that we later regret. And so an example of this is a wake lock. If you were, just, if you were to generally describe a wake lock, you're saying, we've given the application, the, any application can tell the OS, stay awake until I say to go to sleep indefinitely. And when you give that level of control and there's not really a way to close the loop, you end up with varying battery life. And so we have to figure out then what is the right promise to make to a developer? And what is the range of that promise that we should be giving to enable the use cases, but make sure that the OS can be responsive in the face of adversity or many applications um, taking advantage of the promise that's being made. Um, the other one is that attribution that I mentioned before and, and the controls so that the user can then take advantage of this stuff. And together, the three of these things should give us a much better, better structure. And so this is a, all of this is, again, like you see this little exciting badge about pending review on there. Um, these are really just ideas to articulate how we're approaching the problem um, because we know it's a big change. And so we're trying to broadcast this change really early so you can take advantage of it. You can start moving over to background, check, background limits and uh, targeting O now so that you're not going to have a, a bad time later on. And so some of these things is we need to look at more limits on background scanning. Um, we, we, we have to adjust the, the limits that we're doing. We haven't really gotten around to Bluetooth yet. Um, we're also looking at applications listening to other events on the device and whether those things should be happening or not. Um, the a big one here is deferring work. We want the OS to have more flexibility to have discretion about when jobs run. When it's all services-based, the OS has really no control. If, an app, if a single large install-based application makes a unilateral decision to increase its wake lock time, the OS today and the user is powerless to do anything about it. And so that's why we're looking to make these transitions. And the balance should be now users are more in the driver's seat about what features the application is giving and whether the user finds value in those features running in the background, and then they can articulate that. The default for all these things is on. And, and the model you can roughly think of as, a, as long as you're cool, the OS will be cool, and everybody will be cool, and it's great. Um, if in this scenario, though, applications start getting aggressive, battery starts getting high, scanning rates start getting higher, we may start telling, informing the user, hey, this stuff's kind of heavy on your battery. Do you want it to run in the background? Um, and then they can articulate that, articulate that to the, back to the OS. And then we can you know, begin having a control surface for how we manage individual applications. And so then the user can say, these 10 apps I care about a lot. These other apps, not so much. We're not suggesting that we need to have a micromanaging menu. That's not the desire. But using things like how users are interacting with the application, how often are they interacting with GCM messages when the application gets woken up, how often do they interact with notifications, these are all great signals to inform how the OS should dole out its limited resources, namely battery. Um, and so the, and the last one is we have to, to beef up the idea of foreground service and figure out how, do, how does that as an API surface and how does that as a UI construct um, not turn into all the applications rushing to the exits of foreground service, and then we're back in the same, the same mess that we are now with no control surface again. And we want to find a balance so that applications can generally do everything they need and that in the extremes, the user is able to articulate approval for these extreme situations. And we're hoping that that's going to result in a, a much more stable, much more reliable device in the long run. And so hopefully that gives you a bit of, a bit of insight about how we're approaching um, Android health and, and mostly battery life uh, and resource contention. So, uh, oh, I, I forgot a slide. But the idea here, the last one, was uh, attribu attribution and value. And so we want to really make that, make that identified. I already talked about the points. I won't, I won't bore you repeating it. Uh, and thank you very much for, the, for your time. Thanks. Thanks.